Mary Magdalene interviews Jesus on the subject of resistance to humility. The interview took place in Wondai, Queensland, Australia, on the 5th of September, 2012. This is session five. Okay, well, um, today's my fifth in the series of interviews. And probably the last one. Yes. <laughs> uh, we're here in Wondai this morning. Yeah. I'm a little bit tired because we had a late night last night. Yeah. But, um, we're going to talk about... Well, last week we started talking about the resistances to humility. So today's, today's interview is just wrapping up, really, what are the resistances that we have to humility. Yeah, if everyone remembers, last week we mentioned five or... I think it was five resistances to humility. And today we'll probably cover another five or six uh, resistances to hum humility. But, but, I, but I don't feel they are the only resistances that we have. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so how would you describe what the list that, we've, that we're covering in these interviews? Well, they are the common problems that people have with regard to becoming humble. Um, but I, I don't feel that they are the only problems that we have. And what we've tried to do in the interview, I think, is just try to uh, generalise a little about what, what are the underlying issues and to give people enough feedback to, so that they can understand where their resistances are when it comes to their own humility. Yeah, yeah and my feeling for the interview series has been that I'd love to, to really help people understand what humility is. From, from both sides, we spent a few interviews talking, just describing the quality of humility and how it impacts on our life. And, mm. and I also feel that by understanding the resistances, the common resistances we have to humility, we begin to, to see when we're not being humble. And yes. so hopefully we're giving people some, some really practical tips and information about, about how to live in more humility. Yeah, and if people remember that um, the point of these discussions is that humility opens up this doorway into truth. Without, without humility, you cannot absorb in your soul and emotionally, you cannot absorb more truth. So even though you might be listening to truth and listening to more truth, listening to more truth, it's impossible to actually absorb it while the soul remains in this state of having a lack of humility. As soon as the soul opens up to humility, now this, the listening is translated into beginning to feel the truth. And once you begin to feel the truth, then that opens up your, the, the gateway to receiving love. So, so without this uh, feeling of humility, rather than a, a, a facade of humility, or without this uh, process of going through this process of opening up completely to truth, it's impossible to actually absorb new truth. And I find it interesting how people spend a lot of their day-to-day -day life trying to discover truth, while at the same time, they spend a lot of their day-to-day -day life uh, re uh, suppressing the emotions that they have, which cause them to be closed towards receiving new truth. And so it's like many of them intellectually are working directly against the emotions that are present in the soul. Yeah. Yeah, setting up a battle internally. Yeah, and, th and that's why people can come along and hear truth after truth after truth after truth, but it never really touches their life. Mm. It's only going to touch our life when we become humble and actually allow this truth, uh, you know, get rid of the resistances to, to the truth and allow this truth to become absorbed in the soul. Once, once the truth is absorbed in the soul, then we will act upon it. Uh, it's only then, in fact, that we'll act upon it. Before then, we will talk about it and we'll listen about it. We might be fascinated by it, but, but at the end of the day, we're never going to act upon it. And, and if we don't act upon it, our life will never change. Mm -hmm. It's only by acting upon it that your life changes. And so uh, the, the, the drive to act upon truth comes from this underlying development of this quality of humility. Mm. Mm. Okay. Well, so far I think we've discussed, um, in terms of resistances to humility, we've mm -hmm. discussed arrogance, yeah. anger towards others, mm -hmm. hatred I think we covered, mm -hmm. And um, the facade or the ego, I think yes. we mentioned earlier. Yep. So to start off today, I wanted to ask you about fear and specifically this idea of living in fear. Yes, I feel fear is one of the most difficult emotions that people have to process. 
and also is one of the biggest resistances that a person has to being humble. Today, it's sort of taken as a negative if you feel afraid about anything. Mm. And yet the world and, and people in it are full of fear about everything. Yeah. But, but we continuously try to satisfy this fear by creating safety or creating security which really is a way of uh, making out the fear is not there. And, and as soon as this safety or security is taken away, the fear is exposed. And if persons uh, looked at that, really what we're doing is we're living in fear. Mm. We're not actually feeling the emotion of fear. What we're doing is we're, we're honoring our fear, holding it within us, and then asking the environment to pander to the fear that we have inside of ourselves. Mm -hmm. If we truly want to be free and also truly want to be humble, we need to actually go through the process of feeling the fear rather than living in the fear. And this is very, very difficult if we are justifying to ourselves that the fear exists or we're minimizing to ourselves that, oh, yes, I have some fear, but it doesn't really have that a large impact on my life. Uh, or I'm shifting the blame of our fear. Oh, you caused my fear all the time. Like you, you made me afraid and so now I can be angry with you or now I can just reject you from my life because you've made me afraid. And these kind of attitudes towards our fear cause us to deny our fear. We, and I think that was one of the points we generally covered last week was denial. Yes. But, but what we're doing now is looking at if we deny our fear, we will live in it we will actually create a life where all of our fears, or as many of them as possible, are um, satisfied by some kind of safety or security thing that we, we need to go through. So, so for example, on the earth today, you've got people who are afraid of financial insecurity. So what they do is they create a financial buffer. Mm -hmm. So in the Western world, many people are very interested in not living to week, week to week anymore because, of, because they feel they need this financial buffer. And, and so what they do is they save up money and they place that money in the bank. And of course, this allows our funds to be misused in all sorts of ways, but, but it all is driven by this underlying fear. And if you take the money away from them out of the bank, it's a major disaster in their life, which means that the fear itself hasn't actually gone. It's still present. And, and, it, and in fact, we finish up attracting events to trigger the presence of the fear inside of ourselves because God wants us to release it. God wants us to have no fear inside of our soul. But while we have this fear, we are and we're living in it and justifying it, minimizing it and shifting the blame of it onto other people, we are in reality justifying or, or in fact, like I've said to you many times in our private discussions, we're placing our fear as our God. Mm -hmm. Like God, instead of God being the God and all of God's laws being important, our fear becomes the most important thing. And we're willing to do anything else in our life until our fear is triggered, if that's the proper word, or exposed. And as soon as our fear is exposed, our fear becomes God. And w whatever integrity we had just flew out the window, whatever courage we had just flew out the window, and whatever of these other very beautiful qualities that we have, love, kindness, compassion, and all these other qualities, all of them flew out, fly out the window as well while we were living in this place. And, and in the end, we're just living honoring our own fear rather than actually feeling the fear itself and going through the process of releasing it by experiencing it properly. So it sounds like what you're saying, when I live in fear, I allow the avoidance of my fear or the prevention of my fear to guide and direct just about everything. And it's, and it's only when fear is... I've done that enough that fear is absent that then my, my higher ideals might come into play. So my desire for God or my desire to love or be good or give. Yeah. Um, so what does well, it... I, was, I think it's good to say at this point yeah. and, uh, uh, is that um, when you live in your fear, desire is also suppressed. Mm. And this is a very important thing because, because desire is the source of most of our happiness. 
So if we're suppressing our desire because we're afraid, then of course we're also suppressing the potential of our own happiness because of we're afraid. So, so for example, if, uh, if a person's living in a relationship that they're not happy with, uh, but they're afraid to leave because of security reasons, if financial or physical security reasons, then they are going to be a very hap unhappy, suppressed individual while they remain in that particular relationship. Unless the source of their unhappiness uh, changes. In other words, unless the other person in the relationship changes what they do, they are going to remain very unhappy. They've now made their life entirely dependent upon the other person's choice to be loving, which is not a very wise thing to do in the long run, but also they've made their own happiness dependent uh, and also they've made their own happiness almost impossible because they're suppressing their fear of the financial insecurity, of the physical insecurity. They're suppressing this fear by staying. But when you suppress one emotion, like fear, you are also going to suppress desire. And actually, fear itself suppresses desire. Mm -hmm. So while I am so afraid, I am not going to feel any desire. This is one reason why many women in their relationships do not feel sexual desire, because they have a lot of deep underlying fears that they're suppressing through the relationship, such as, such as financial and physical security issues, and they're using the relationship to suppress those particular things, but while their fear is being suppressed, their desire, their, even their sexual desire, will also be suppressed. So it's a, it's a source of much unhappiness on the planet, this, this living in fear and using the external environment to suppress the feeling of fear rather than just going through and experiencing the feeling of fear. Mm -hmm. And it's also a major impediment to a person being humbled to receiving any truth because every single time they want to justify the retaining of their own fear. Mm -hmm. You know, you think of how many conversations we've had where you've wanted to justify mm -hmm. why you should be afraid and why I should honour that fear that you have. Absolutely. And, and the majority of people that we meet are very similar. They want to justify why they shouldn't have to be loving in certain circumstances. They want to justify why they shouldn't have to do certain things. And even then, things that are blatantly unloving, they will justify because their fear has become their God. Yes, yeah, yeah I, I, certainly I relate to that from my own experience, but also something that surprises me as I go on and I do, I am beginning to face more fears is how much I really, you mentioned that so many people are unhappy. I really equated happiness with feeling comfortable and safe. Mm -hmm. And and I was actually quite unhappy, but mm -hmm. I, I understood this feeling to be happiness. And it's only as I begin to challenge more fears and strive for humility that I find, oh no, there's joy in happiness. There's, there's mm -hmm. this other quality that was missing in my life. I feel more alive. Mm -hmm. um, and many people I, I observe are just walking through life thinking, oh, this is happiness. And mm -hmm. it's almost like they've settled for something less than alive because mm -hmm. they just equate safety with happiness. Yes, and also fear is a, a great excuse for not acting. Yeah. Like, so most people you know, a lot of our joy comes from our actions, from, from what we decide to do with our life and what we finish up creating because we do. And when we are in a process of feeling, uh, not feeling our fear, but living in our fear, what we finish up doing is we finish up suppressing this desire to act. Mm -hmm. And so we finish up having a life where we are very stagnant in our life where we do the same things every day, it's quite boring, we only do what's safe, we, only, we don't extend ourselves in any way, we, we are unable to grow. And if, if we do not grow, we can't be happy either, by the way. And in addition, uh, there's this other problem, and that is fear prevents us from accepting truth. Because fear tells us that the false belief is true. Mm. And, and it doesn't matter what fear we have, Whenever we have this feeling of fear, it is telling us that the false belief is true. And, and what I see people often doing with their fear is they're justifying to themselves that their fear is true constantly. And they're telling themselves that their fear is the truth. Like most women tell themselves that they should be afraid of men mm. as if that is a truth. Right? And they act like that's the truth. Now, many of the women have never been harmed by men most of their life, many of these same women who are afraid. Now, there are some women who are afraid, and of course, this, because they have, have actually been harmed by men, and of course, all the other women look at that, and then they go, oh, 
they've been harmed so I could be harmed, mm -hmm. not understanding how harm actually is created or any of those kind of things. And, and in the process of doing that, this, they decide that their fear is justified. It's important to be afraid of men, right? And you must hold on to this fear of men. And many men do the same thing with women, of course, with different beliefs, but they're just based on fear. So many men who have an attractive woman as a wife or a partner, they're afraid that she will go off with somebody else because they underlying all of that is their own fear that they don't have the worth to actually keep the woman that, that they're with. And that underlying suppression of this fear causes them to live in a state of jealousy. Mm -hmm. and, and we see these kind of things happening all the time. And the reason why is because the fear itself causes us to be totally blocked to truth because we're actually believing a different truth than what is God's truth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I put the different truth in quotation marks because it's not really a truth. And even right down to the fear of death, you know, we believe death is a traumatic experience. We believe, you know, many people are afraid because they do not believe there is any such thing as a life after death. And so they see death as the termination of their complete existence. And the other people who do not believe that um, have no determin determined or, or clear viewpoint of what their life after death would be like. And so they are very afraid of it. And as a result of that, we fear death so much. We'll do almost anything to avoid death. In fact, the majority of people will do anything to avoid death. If it means, you know, allowing themselves to, you know, be raped or, 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 or you know, lying or stealing or cheating or all of these other things on, on other people, if they're, if they're faced with death, they'll do it most of the time. And then if they won't do it for the facing of their own death, they certainly will do it for the facing of a death of someone they love. Yes. And, and this is all an indication of a false belief that they're living in every single day. And so people who live in fear, who live in false beliefs every day, are easily manipulated. You can, a, an external person or a society can manipulate that individual into doing whatever the society or external person wants them to do. So it's not a state of freedom either. Mm -hmm. It's a state where you're allowing manipulation because you're afraid. And all a person has to do is trigger that fear or, or, or expose that fear and all of a sudden you'll act a certain way. This, you know, this is how uh, we, you and I have noticed recently how many adverts there are on television for cleaners that clean 99.99% of the germs, yeah. right? And there's still 0.01% of the germs and it only takes one germ to get into your body and, and at the end of the day, you're still gonna get something. Um, but, but there's this, there's this um, feeling in people that, oh, well, you know, so what's the fear? The fear of being sick, the fear of, you know, having a life interrupted through sickness or whatever. And this fear, not understanding the truth, that all sickness is created through something that's going on of denial in the soul, not understanding that truth, they then, oh, that's the pine, you know, that's the, yeah. that's the product I have to buy, you know, yeah. because that, that's going to give me the most feeling of security. Not realising in that moment they're buying a product that is only to avoid their fear mm. of perhaps becoming sick. So if we can just rewind a little bit to some of the things you've just mentioned, mm -hmm. um, because I, I feel there's, when you say that fear is not real, and, and then at another point you talked about people justifying their fear, are you saying that when we understand truth, there will be nothing adverse that will happen in our life? Is, is no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that if, if, we under, if we are in a state of complete love, and that is a state of one with God, which means we are also in a state of understanding the truth about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And it's not understanding the truth about everything mm -hmm. at that point, because there's still many truths to learn. But once we're in a state of complete love, fear itself does not exist to us. It doesn't mean that we won't attract events that, uh, because of other people and what they choose to do, that, that events might not come to us that, that the average person would be afraid of. Mm -hmm. But we just will not feel afraid of it. Mm -hmm. that, that, and therefore, we will attract less events. We may still have events happening to us that other people would be afraid of, but the reality is we would not feel afraid in exactly the same circumstances. Mm -hmm. 
So if there's a spirit influenced person in a rage with us, looking like they with a knife in their hand and, and looking like you know they were going to do something with that knife, we, we won't feel afraid in that state. Right? We'll know exactly the things that we need to say or do to to ensure that the situation remains safe. And if we can't maintain the safety, we're not afraid of our own death. We're not afraid of being hurt because we can heal ourselves, but we're also not afraid of dying because we know there's no such thing as dying. And we're not afraid of the pain either because we know we can manage pain in that state. So, so there is nothing to be afraid of, literally, in that state. Uh, and so we're not afraid of violence anymore. So someone can threaten us with violence, but it has no effect on us. Mm. If we're living in fear, it's completely different. In the same situation, if we're living in fear, we'd go, man, it's got a knife. I need a, something to protect myself. I need to run or I need to, or I need to attack. And often this is what does cause us to attack. You know, if I've got a gun, I'll pull it out and shoot him because he was going to attack me. And, and these are all actions based around now our fear of our own death, our fear of our own being harmed or someone we love being harmed. And these fears are now driving reactions. So, so basically, from what you're saying, when we justify fear, we will never reach the state that you're describing now because we will never enter into a process of feeling it, we will live in it. Yeah. Is that what you mean when you say fear is not real? Because certainly it's an emotion that exists, isn't it? Yes, um, please understand when I say that fear is not real, I'm not saying that it's not an emotion that exists within the person, because it certainly is mm -hmm. an emotion that exists in the person, but it's just not real for God from God's perspective. The emotion was created by a false belief or a lack of love sometime in their history. Mm -hmm. So from God's perspective, the emotion of fear was created by a false belief perpetrated against the child or an emotion of a lack of love perpetrated towards the child that causes the child now to believe that its fear is real. From God's perspective, the fear is not real. It's not the truth. Mm -hmm. There's nothing the child actually needs to be afraid of, right? But nothing at all, in fact. But the child is going to feel afraid while it's had these unloving and untruthful things perpetrated against it until it releases it. So the fear exists as re in reality inside the individual, but from God's perspective, it is not the truth about the situation, but the person believes it's the truth about the situation. Yes, yeah, I see that. There's an error in perception, can mm -hmm. we call it that? Mm -hmm. But if we can just be, I really want to be hone in on this issue. Well, one of the reasons why, though, is because you're, you're still going through this process emotionally of coming to accept that the fear is not real. And, and I see it reflected <laughs> around me also. Yeah, yeah. So um, we can move on from there. No, no, and just, no, no. But I just know it's that... It's an important question because most people, people believe those. the fear is real. Yes. And so therefore they act upon it, they live in it, they do not do anything about experiencing it, they don't go through the emotional experience of feeling it. Yeah. yeah. So if you, if you give the example of the small boy who is in a situation where there's a lack of love, perhaps there's violence in his parents around mm -hmm. him, mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned that from God's perspective he has nothing to fear. No. Okay. So what is happening can in I that straight, situation? Can I say yeah. why? Yeah. If the boy is harmed in any way, then most of the time his spirit friends will help him go out of his body while he's being harmed. So there'd be very little physical pain associated with the harm. Secondly, God is always trying to help the individual themselves, even if they are a child, to, to, to avoid the pain of being harmed by others. Mm -hmm. and, and so that, you know, that's something that God will, uh, will support the spirits who, who are guiding the child in doing. Mm -hmm. In addition, um, if the child does pass, the child will be in a very loving place in the spirit world. The child has nothing to fear about its future. So it has nothing to fear that it's not going to be loved. And it, but unfortunately, the child believes it's not going to be loved because it's told it's not going to be loved by the parents. And because of the parents' belief systems that there is no afterlife or there is no future, of course, the child also feels that uh, as a truth. And so, so the child is afraid in a violent situation because the child has already been taught the truth, soul to soul, from the parents to the child. The child naturally now is afraid of the situation. If, if the child has had no emotional injuries in the situation, 
if the child had not have this, did not have this belief that if it died it was going to be dead forever, if it did not have the belief that it would be unloved, then the child would not actually feel afraid in the situation of violence. That's the reality. But the reason why the child does feel afraid is because it already has all of these beliefs inside of it that it obtained from the parents from the moment of conception onwards. And so all of these beliefs colour the child's perspective of what is real. Mm-hmm. And, and what the child sees is real is not what God sees is real. Right? Now there's usually nothing the child can do about it as a child, but there is certainly many things we can do about it as an adult. As an adult, we can choose to experience the fears that have been placed upon us by our parental and our environment during the time we were growing up. We can choose to experience them and release them and not live in them anymore. That will give us this sense of complete freedom and help us to absorb the truth. And the truth will set us free. Mm -hmm. The truth will set us free from any of these um, feelings that cause us to feel like we are constrained in Mm -hmm. any way. It will allow us to also follow our desires and passions without restriction Mm because fear places a restriction. And so if we allow ourselves to see that the only reason why even the child is afraid in any situation is because it already has the same societal and parental false beliefs that the parents and society have within themselves. And these false beliefs have also now entered the child. And that is the reason why the child is afraid. If we could, as adults, release these fear-based emotions, the next generation of children would have less fear. And eventually we'd get to a, a generation of children that had no fear at all. Right? No fear in them whatsoever. Even if somebody was angry or upset, they'd still not be afraid. They would not even expect anybody to ever attack them. And as a result of that, there'd be less people who would attack them as well. And so they, they would be in this complete state of freedom. Now, that's the gift we can give to the next generation if we choose to experience our fear rather than live in it. When we live in it, we have no uh, way to give a gift to the next generation. In fact, what we're doing is we're giving the next generation the same impediment that we ourselves have been given by our own previous by the previous generation. Mm. Mm. Okay. Well, um, obviously, from what we've discussed, many people are living in fear, mm-hmm. uh, and many, I suppose, such as myself, uh, as I was, living in a lot of fear and not even recognising that fear was really guiding the avoidance of fear was guiding everything in my life. So, what are some what are some clues or tips that how can we, if I'm such a person and I think I hear Jesus talking about living in fear, how would I come to recognise I might be living in fear? Well, with all emotions that exist within us, we have to go through a process of realisation of what's within us. Now, the only way that we can really do that is firstly intellectually accepting that there probably is some fear within us. So if we, if we at the beginning, believe there is no fear within us, well, I feel that is a state of complete delusion. Like, but, but, and many of us are li- many people on the planet are living in that state of complete delusion. Mm-hmm. But once we allow just even the intellectual thought that perhaps there is fear within us, the way that God's laws work is we, our soul then starts to attract through through the law events that show us what our fears actually are, at least at an intellectual level. Once our fears are exposed at an intellectual level, um, we can at least now be conscious that we have them. And once we start looking at the fact that we have them, we can now start allowing ourselves to feel about having them and feel and allow ourselves to have the experience of having them. The problem there, unfortunately, though, is that we've been taught from a very young age, because of the society and our parents as well, denying their own fears, we've been taught from a very young age that the important thing in life is to deny that you have any fear. And so once we start feeling or experiencing the fear that we actually have, we're going to go through probably a process of being attacked by the world around us and our parental system, even as an adult because they will say, no, you shouldn't go down that track. That's a dangerous place to go and so forth. But the reality is we need to go there if we're going to experience our fear. 
And so what we have to do then is go through this whole process of reducing all of these impediments to our feeling of our own fear. Mm -hmm. And these impediments are all a, a series of false beliefs that we have imbibed from the society and the world around us and that are now a part of us. False beliefs such as, I'm not able to feel all of my fear. My fear will completely overwhelm me and I'll be so emotionally distraught that I'll feel like I'm going crazy. So a fear of going nuts is going to also cause us to not allow ourselves to feel our fear. Then there's also a lot of emotions about being humiliated when we're in a state of fear. And often people do choose to humiliate us when we feel fear. Also, uh, generally, our body is shaking when we feel fear. And, and most people around us who are terrified of feeling their own fear look at a person whose body is shaking and go, if you haven't got some kind of disease, then there's something wrong with you. <laughs> you know, they want the, to associate it with some kind of disease some kind of motor neuron, neuron yeah. disease uh, rather than actually go, no, you, you, you're actually having a feeling of fear, right? Yeah. And so people get very stressed out around it. And you've got to go through all of those impediments of all the people and what they think about your feeling of your fear. And once you've done all of that, then you'll probably get to your fear. <laughs> and and so um, and but the, and that is a process, and it's a very different process for each individual because each individual has had a different history. Each individual has had a different home life and a different society life, uh, and so it depends on which country we are as to wh what you know the viewpoints will happen as well, and and what was suppressed and what is allowed and so forth. So it just depends upon the environment that we've grown up in as to how we get to that point. But but it will go through those processes that I've mentioned. So you've just described all of the different resistances we might have to experiencing fear, the f essentially other fears of what would, ha what would happen. Yeah, many of them will be beliefs as well, which mm -hmm. have entered us as an emotional belief. We believe it so strongly that we have an emotional reaction when somebody challenges that belief. So all of those beliefs that we carry around fear, are they the things that cause us to justify fear or live in fear? Yes, they, they are. The, the belief systems that we have that are all false around, around our fear are the things that cause our fear to be completely locked down. And, and so what we choose to do then is instead of experiencing the fear, we choose to live in it. Or what I mean by that is we choose, the, the fear is really uh, the underlying emotion that needs to be felt. And then on top of that, we have created a whole series of addictions so that we don't have to face these fears. Mm. And these series of addictions can be anything from substances right the way through to emotions and relationships even, and an entire life to avoid the fear. And in fact, so most people on the planet have created, when they first realise this, they have actually created an entire life in addiction to avoid their fears. Mm -hmm. And once you start going through and breaking all of that down, of course your life has to change. And most people are terrified of that as well because some people like their life as they are because it helps them avoid all of their fears. <laughs> they <laughs> think it's happy when really they just feel comfortable and safe. Yeah, that's yeah. right. It's all about safety and security. If you, you ask the average woman in, woman in a relationship what's the primary reason why she's in a relationship, and for many women it would be a feeling of safety and security. Mm. If, if we were all that honest, perhaps. If we were all honest, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the problem, of course, with fear is very few people are honest about it. Yeah. And that, that'll justify you know, all sorts of things. You know, we had a discussion last night where a person is just shutting themselves down completely, shutting down every desire, and they're telling themselves they don't know why they feel numb. But why they feel numb is because they are unwilling to feel their fear, and they know all this fear is in there now, Yes. And now they're trying to shut it all down. And so they suppress their fear, shut down, that shuts down everything, shuts down desire as well. And now they feel numb. They're just going through life like this in a bit of a daze. And, and it's a very uh, even angry state uh, surrounding the fear, not wanting to go into the fear. And then going, oh, you know, everything's pretty hard to see. I don't know. Then you start developing doubts as well because this is what fear does. You know, you start, oh, I don't know if it's the truth anymore. I don't know if it's the right thing to do. And, and off we go down this track. And before we know it, we've convinced ourselves to completely take a different course of action in our life other than a passionate course of action, you know, to have a passionate life. And the main reason why we've done that has got nothing to do with the fact that we like it. 
It's got everything to do with the fact of what we're, how terrified we are and what we want to avoid. Mm. So from what you're saying, um, if I was to launch into uh, living my life not in fear but dealing with fear, mm -hmm. I would be looking at these addictions but something interesting that you just talked about then was taking action. And is that another way that we can start to challenge ourselves to experience fear rather than live in it? Yeah, I feel it's one of the best ways of experiencing fear, actually, is to, is to write down a list of everything that you intellectually know you're afraid of. And, and to be frank, the majority of the list, if we're honest with ourselves, will turn out to be emotions mm -hmm. rather than actually events or circumstances or situations. Right? Yes. So most of our fears uh, revolve around certain emotions, actually, you know, that we are afraid of experiencing, that we feel we cannot experience, that we will be overwhelmed or we'll be so, uh, we won't be able to cope with the underlying feeling. And so, and so our majority of our fears are all about emotions in the end. But if, even if we wrote down all of our fears about situations that we're afraid of, and then we chose every single day to have one of those situations occur, yes. right? And, you know, and particularly when these situations are, are, are not uh, what I would classify to be damaging to us again. So, so if we're afraid of rape, I'm not suggesting that you go and get yourself raped just so that you can feel the fear of being raped. I, but if you're afraid of opening your heart to a person, right, then I definitely would suggest that you, you, know, you choose a person who you feel attracted to and, and start developing a relationship and let yourself open your heart and see where it takes you. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Like, Absolutely. So you know, there are obvious fears that we have that it would be unwise to uh, you know, attract the situation um, to, to confront the fear, but, but there are literally hundreds of fears that we have that we can completely attract the fear. Uh, you know attract the situation and actually it would be positive for us to attract the situation mm -hmm. and and actually desire the situation so that we work through the potential fear but we shouldn't go through it in a in a way of i'm going to conquer this fear feeling this is the way people go through it often so they they have a situation and it's all about conquering the fear no it's not it's all about experiencing the fear which is a softening to the fear yes. not a feeling of anger towards the fear and that you're going to control survive. it and survive and suppress yeah. it and and so if we go into this process of confronting our fears with the other attitude this angry attitude of conquering the fear then in the end it won't benefit us uh, at all we'll still have all the fears inside of us after we've finished all of the events we've had on our list if we go into it as a, into every single situation like even if we're just afraid of something like speaking up in a situation with men or women then when a situation comes up where where i have a different opinion and there's a group of men or women there i'd speak up mm -hmm. and 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 let what happens happens and go ah that's the reason why i'm so afraid of this particular event you know because i got attacked there and i was condescended to there and i don't want to feel those feelings mm -hmm. and and it, we can literally m make a list of hundreds of our fears if we wanted to and actually go through the process of creating situations or being conscious of situations we are already creating because that's usually the case anyway and and allowing ourselves to actually feel and experience the fear and the reason why we have it in those particular situations mm. and that's very very different than going into it with an attitude i'm going to conquer this fear so i'm going to become a public speaker i'm afraid of public speaking i'm going to, be going to become a public speaker no matter how hard it is like you know that kind of feeling is not softening to the experience of your fear once you experience your fear of public speaking for example and you realize what it's all about and most of the time that is about people thinking you're an idiot the way people look at you how they condescend towards you as you're speaking and all those other things they're all to do with people's perception and opinion of you once you release those fears you'll be able to get up in front of an audience who's throwing throw eggs at you and you'll still be able to say what you <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what you want to say without without having any fear yeah yeah and i suppose i i'm reflecting on my own experience in the last four years mm. even mm -hmm. um as you're speaking about these things and my own attitudes to fear and my living in fear and it very much feels like when um when i recognized even intellectually that i had so much fear in me i did go into this place knowing okay I've got to deal with it and it was almost an anger about having fear and, mm. and a bullying of myself to get through experiences mm. and I got through some experiences 
and I didn't grow at all mm. and and I've had to had have, have many more experiences of the same type of the same type in order to to really soften into the into the experience yeah. and and now I feel like I'm even less as you were mentioning less afraid of experiences and events it's like appealing back and I, I'm getting through some of those fears and now I'm left with this very raw terror of actual emotions inside yeah. of me and when we confront our fears that's what it's going to be like and in the end we'll go through this angry place probably where we want to control them and confront them that way and then we'll realize that that never released anything and then we'll get to the point where we soften to them and allow ourselves to you know be out of control which is all and then you allow yourself to experience it it's, it's like remaining present during mm-hmm. the experience yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I feel that you know that's where most people will go in that same direction eventually. Um, I see a lot of people who believe they have no fear at all, so they're in complete denial of it, or they acknowledge their fears without having any desire to actually feel their way through them. And both of those places are complete lack of humility, and they're also living in the fear. So every single day your life will be creating things to, to, to actually begin to expose this fear to yourself. And, uh, or you've actually created an entire life to prevent anything from being exposed to yourself. And this final question on mm-hmm. fear, obviously, mm-hmm. it's a big theme for me. Sorry, but um, you mentioned the the magic kind of relationship between fear and desire. Mm-hmm. And when we live in fear, we're basically desireless. Um, but something that I'd love your input on is that I'm recognising lately is that when I'm led by desire into experiences, then my fear is released from me more naturally. If I decide um, not, for example, with public speaking, right, I'm afraid of public speaking, so I'm just going to go and do it and get up there and do it, nothing much seems to happen. Mm -hmm. But if I feel in my heart and I think... You know, I'd really love to share divine truth with people. Or I'd really love to share the subject of cooking with people. Yeah, or, 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 or whatever, subject, it whatever it is. Whatever it is, yes. bike riding or <laughs> how to make a car or whatever the subject oh, is. And I've got this idea of how to do that. Yeah. It's going to involve public speaking. Yeah. But if I go into it led by a desire that's more loving, mm-hmm. my fear seems to exit me more naturally. That is only the case under one circumstance, right. though. And what that is, is that? when the desire is greater than the fear mm. so so if our fear is greater than our desire what will happen is our desires will be completely suppressed by the fear we will not act upon them what we need to do is grow our desires enough and lessen our fear enough through understanding the truth about fear lessen our fear enough so that our desire exceeds our fear once our desire exceeds our fear we will definitely go ahead and do something that we're afraid of and our fear is no longer our God. What we desire becomes more important to us than what we fear. So that's the magic uh, b- um, sliding scale, isn't it? Because exactly. Because many people are frozen with desire under fear. That's correct. So is the answer to grow desire? Well, it's to, to do both. To do both. It's always to do both. Grow the desire so that, so that you feel your desire and you feel passionate about your desire, you see how important your desire is, you see where, what it might give you. In other words, you're going to have to have some faith about the future and where, where your desire will take you. And you're going to have some trust. That, you know, you, so you develop these qualities that help support your desire. And then at the same time, you start chipping away at the untruth mm-hmm. related to your fear. And so you need to chip away at it enough so that, so, so that your, your fear starts going down and your desire starts going up. Now, once they pass that equilibrium point and the desire exceeds the fear, now you will act. And, and it will be a natural action. It won't be something you've been pushing yourself into doing, trying hard to do, but it will be a natural action that can be taken. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank but it's a, it's a big, big block to humility, fear. And in fact, if you look at many of the other things we've discussed, you know, like things like anger, for example, that all comes from fear anyway. And if you look at hatred, that all comes from fear. And, you know, so these blocks to humility, many of them are actually fear-based in nature. 
Um, even though I think the next one you're going to raise is well, all fear-based in nature Yeah, as well. that's what I was going to raise something related to fear, which is doubt, okay, um, so. which we don't often necessarily associate as a fearful experience. But So um, my question is, what is doubt? Um, I don't know, know whether doubt is a feeling. I, I sort of feel more like doubt is a state that we place ourselves in, or, or to be more specific, that our fear places us in, in order to prevent us from taking actions. Mm. In other words, we often doubt when we're in a situation where we don't know what to do, we don't know what action to take. And most of the time we're in that place is because there is no seeming good outcome from any of the possible actions. So what we do inside of ourselves when we're faced with any choice or decision is we have a situation or circumstance appear, there appears to be no choice that will end up with a happy or, or you know, joyful outcome for us. And so what we do is we do not want to make any choice. We, we go into a state of inaction. We don't want to take a decision just in case that decision may cause our situation to become even worse. And when we do not see any potential positive for any of our choices or decisions, what we decide to do then is to support that state, to support the state of inaction. And doubt causes us to be able to support the state of inaction. We don't have to act upon anything when we're in the state of doubt. And we don't have to get ourselves out of the state of doubt. In fact, we will have all sorts of justifications to ourselves in the state of doubt. We'll say to ourselves, oh, it's impossible to know the truth about that. Or, no, it's impossible to act upon that because no matter what happens, it's going to turn out bad. Mm. Um, and, and so we don't see any light, if you like, at the end of the tunnel. In fact, doubt is closely related to the emotion of hope in the sense that if we feel hopeless, we will often create many doubts to support our hopelessness. Mm. When we have hope, then it causes us to actually have a desire to act in, a, in one direction. But when we, there is no hope, we often then have no no idea what to do, no idea what we can, what actions we can take. Mm. And would you say that hope is related to faith? C certainly, faith, hope, love are all very, very uh, closely related to each other, along with courage, integrity, and other emotions. Are all mm. all of these what the human race views as positive emotions? Are all very closely related to each other in that they support each other. Mm -hmm. Uh, doubt is one of these emotions that supports our fear mm. and so it causes us to have indecision and, um, and to not be able to finish up making choices that will actually produce positive or any outcome in our life actually. Mm. Um, yeah. And, and from what you're saying it sounds like doubt is actually a place we go to when we want to avoid any emotional experience. And avoid any action. action. Um, so, so, and and in the place of doubt, we attract other people who have the same doubts. I, I don't know if anybody's ever noticed that, but but that's normally what happens. So, so when you start expressing these doubts and feeling these doubts that you actually have, all of a sudden there's like heaps of spirits and people on earth who just gather around you and say, "Yeah, it is like that, isn't it?" And yeah, that's how I feel too. And yeah, and so now we have a support group for our doubt, <laughs> um, which is which is a support group for us to have no action yeah. so so i often see many groups that have been created on earth you know are actually supporting each other to have no action to to remain in a state of doubt just to talk and talk and talk and talk without doing anything so are you saying that when we're in a state of doubt we can't ever reach a resolution is that inherent in the state well, we, well the only the, the fastest way to tr to trigger doubt i feel is to act like, you know, take, taking an action will actually help us with our doubt. But we need to understand what, what is the underlying cause of our doubt. The underlying cause of our doubt is our resistance. So a lack of humility towards our own fear. Mm. That's the underlying lying cause of doubt. It's a resistance or a lack of t humility towards taking action in our life, to being responsible for our life, for our personal life. Now, God is trying to teach us constantly to take responsibility for our personal life. And we're often in the state where we feel like, oh, well, if I do that, then this will happen, and I don't like that outcome. If I do that, this will happen, and I don't like that outcome. If I do that, this will happen, and I don't like that outcome. So it's better for me just to say, oh, I don't know what to do. Mm. And then I don't have to choose any of those potential outcomes. 
and if I can give more practical situations. So you might be in a relationship that where you're having lots of fights and arguments. And fights and arguments are always caused by each person, usually in the relationship, not wanting, or at least one of the persons in a relationship, not wanting to, to be humble, not wanting to look at the actual emotion that exists within themselves, right? And so, so what we do in this relationship is we fight, we fight, we fight. Now, th obviously, um, we like fighting. Or we wouldn't do it. Or we wouldn't do it. Yeah. Right? And one of the reasons why we like fighting is because fighting gets us out of acting any differently. Mm. We, we don't have to do something different. It's something that we're comfortable with. Mm. Right? And we don't have to do anything different. We don't have to come to a resolution of why we are fighting. Right? And, and doubt causes us to, uh, to, to avoid the underlying reasons of, as to why we're fighting. Mm. We can focus on unfortunately and many people do in a relationship is they focus on the problem being the fight and the subject of the fight rather than seeing that actually it's all about the avoidance of specific emotions inside of themselves that they're in fear of feeling and their inability to make a choice different is due to their doubt mm -hmm. that they don't know what different choice they can make only because they don't like the potential outcomes of the different choices so for example if you're fighting and you choose differently you could choose to walk away but why don't you walk away? There's got to be a reason that, that you, it will turn out to be uncomfortable or for you. Mm -hmm. So what, you, what do you choose? You could sit there and take the other person's rage with that and feel how bad that feels. But why don't you want to do that? Oh, because that means that I'll be humiliated or somebody you know, be harming me and I want to defend myself and I want to be rebellious to that or something like that. So I don't like that outcome. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I could choose to separate from the person. Oh, then all my emotional insecurities and all my financial insecurities are all triggered. So that doesn't seem like a very good outcome. So what am I left with? Fighting. Mm. And I'll stay in fighting for as long as it takes for me to realise that I have another choice. <laughs> but I don't want to take any of those choices, and so I'd rather doubt that those choices will ever lead me anywhere. So I say, oh, that won't work, that won't work, that won't work, that won't work, and I'm left with fighting. And I like that. So you're really saying fighting, perpetual fighting, is being in a state of doubt? Well, it's about, it's about resistance to taking another action. Mm -hmm. And, and the only reason why we would resist taking another action is because we're afraid. Mm -hmm. And so, and the only reason why we don't want to act is because we're afraid. And, and in between the two feelings, like the fear and the fighting, is our doubt that any other action will actually fix the problem. Yes. Yeah. Right? And, and so we don't believe the actual problem will be fixed. We feel, have a feeling of hopelessness associated with the problem actually being repaired. And we feel that, and we keep doing the same thing over and over. The definition of you know, stupidity, same thing over and over again. We keep doing it because we do not wish to take another action. Mm. And therefore we lack humility. Right? Yeah, mm. okay. A couple more questions about doubt yep. itself. Yep. Um, in this postmodernist world, I've heard it said that doubt is actually a good thing. <laughs> yeah, doubt, doubt has become a, an attractive bohemian uh, lifestyle attribute, basically. A mark of your A mark your of a person's intellectual prowess and philosophical state. Yeah. Right? And the reality is, no, it just has masked a whole heap of fears that the majority of those people do not want to face. They don't want to face that they don't know the answers or they don't want to face that the answers are not very pleasant, mm. for example. And so we can then go into a state of, oh, maybe this is true, maybe that's true, but I don't know. And when I don't know, I don't have to make any decision. I don't have to make any choice. I don't have to actually do something to fix the problem. I can just keep uh, remaining in this place for as long as it takes, mm. for as long as it takes often is our entire life. Mm. unfortunately and this is how uh, how the world stays in ver in a state of very little change because the majority of people love to feel that there is no solution mm. because a solution requires them to change mm. and they don't want to change and they're afraid of change mm. and why are they afraid of change because they're afraid of all the emotions involved in change right and so what they do is they then go into a state of oh, i doubt that there's any solution 
Right? Now I can, I can live in this state of hopelessness and justify it completely to myself as a state of inaction and therefore nothing around me will change, the world won't change either in that state. And I can talk about, philosophize about how the world is and isn't it terrible how it is, and yet I am a primary contributor by remaining in my fear to taking action and by justifying my doubt to myself. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and often um, I, I, f I seem to see that the idea of having a firm belief is considered to be naive and that doubt is is somehow um, seen to be synonymous with questioning. And from what you're saying, questioning and doubt are two very different things. Yeah, doubt is a place where you've already made up your mind. It's not a questioning attitude. You've already made up your mind because there is no, you've already made up your mind there is no good outcome. Mm. There is no outcome that isn't going to trigger a fear that you have inside of yourself. And so you've already made up your mind as to what the truth is and that there is no truth on the particular issue. That's what you've actually decided inside of yourself when you're in a state of doubt. You've already decided there is no truth and you're just trying to look for some justification of that being true. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the opposite of asking a question. It's really. the opposite of asking yeah. a question. Um, a person who asks a question like a child, you look how a child learns. The reason why a child learns so rapidly is a child has no doubt to fight with through the process of learning. Generally, it has very little fear associated with learning for the same, you know, and therefore it creates no doubt. It creates no desire to not act. It, it, it's going to act upon what it learns. A mm -hmm. child knows that. Every single day it acts on what it learns from the moment it gets up. Like, you, you look at how a child learns to walk. It gets up, wiggles, wobbles, wobbles, wiggles, wobbles, wobbles bang, hits its head, bop, cries, feels the emotion. It's not afraid of being hurt. It's not afraid of any falling down the stairs. Even though it can't walk, it's still not afraid of falling down the <laughs> stairs. And it falls down the stairs or it falls, and it bumps and bangs. It's got all these injuries and bruises, but it gets up again every single time because it's just released the emotion associated with it. It still has no fear. It doesn't sit there and say, I doubt whether I was created to walk. Yeah. <laughs> I doubt whether I was created to walk because I'm having so many injuries yes, while yeah. it's happening. Yeah. Like, it doesn't say that at all. It no. doesn't use any intellectual process like that. What it does instead is it allows itself to go through a process and, and it, you know, it, it stands, wobbles, falls over, gets hurt. Mm -hmm. And even when it gets hurt, it doesn't hold on to the hurt. It mm -hmm. just has a big cry. You know, using mum or daddy gives it a hug as well. You know, it gets a bit of love as well in the process. And and five minutes later, where is it again? In the same situation, standing up again, <laughs> like yeah. in the and often in the same dangerous situation, yeah. standing up again, and having the same dangerous effect uh, uh, until it and and it processes its hurt every single single time, and eventually it learns how to walk. Mm. And once it learns how to walk, it has confidence, you know, it's got all the confidence and usually, and usually this happens within a period of like three months for the, or less for the average child. With three months, its life has changed, mm. right? Now, if we had the same action as adults as that, we would learn very rapidly and we would also do very many more powerful things than we are currently doing if we had that attitude. The problem though is that majority of us don't do that. We are so afraid of being hurt, and the child isn't. Mm. The child gets a hurt, bang, hurts itself, has a big cry, it's all gone. The hurt's even gone. It, it can go and play and laugh after it's been hurt, after it's had that cry, because it's released the fear associated with it. And once it's done that, it then acts again, acts again, acts again. It continually acts. and and. We grow up thinking we're now adults and we're all, you know, like bohemian and, and, and uh, you know, worldly, worldly, yeah. worldly and, uh, and we, we've got all of these lovely qualities and one of them is our philosophical doubt and, you know, we hold on to this as if it's some kind of sign of our development of maturity and yeah. sometimes a sign of our growth. But the reality is it's a sign that we're in a state where we do not want to act and we do not want to make a decision. Mm -hmm. That's the sign. Mm -hmm. And no growth ever happens unless we... Cannot happen. Yeah. Yeah. And in this state of doubt, we are complete, we lack humility to every other emotion in that state. We even, even lack the humility to feeling our emotions of a lack of hope, for example. A feeling that no matter what I do, I'll fail. Mm -hmm. No matter what I do, I will be unhappy. Now, these are very 
strong feelings of grief that exist within the average person that we that we get to not feel because we can stay in we can stay in this state of doubt and philosophize about our state of doubt in order to avoid those emotions so if i found myself in a state of doubt i would need to recognize that i'm actually just avoiding some other emotion that i'm afraid of doubt is an addiction covering our fear Mm -hmm. and uh, and so we need to see it as such It's it's something that we're addicted to so that we do not have to act Great. It allows us to remain in two or three or five or ten or fifteen or twenty or a hundred minds, <laughs> you know, and never make a final choice or decision. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and many of us are totally afraid of making final choices and decisions. When, when we made decisions when we were younger, oftentimes if it was the wrong decision in terms of society's viewpoint or our parents' viewpoint, we got severely punished, many times violently. Mm-hmm. So we have a lot of fear of violence associated with our desire to doubt. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Okay, I just need to take a short break sure. and come back. No worries. <laughs> okay, all right. The next um, the next topic is also fairly meaty. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, as they all are. As they, they are. all are, they all have a lot of. Fun. We have we have what we believe are good reasons for not being humble. Yes. <laughs> usually, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> absolutely, and I can feel the resistance even <clears throat> as you're answering some of the questions. It brings up things in me, and I think, oh yes, there's my resistance to humility right mm-hmm. right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, the next one I wanted to talk to you about was. Um, It's a group of things, really. It's about seeking power, seeking position, glory, respect, or value. Mm -hmm. And um, it seems to me that many of us are taught by society or our families that we should seek at least one of those things, if not all of them. Yeah, I think the problem is deeper than that, though, babe. Like, I feel that um, the problem really comes from most of those things not being present in our life, particularly during our childhood. So, so example, when we're children, we're often taught that because the parent is bigger than us, they have power over us. Mm -hmm. And and because the parent generally does not respect the free will of the child, the the parent wants the child to, to do its will, the parent's will. Sure. And so the child feels a feeling of powerlessness. In addition, the parent themselves in that state is already in a state of powerlessness themselves, and that emotion has also entered the child. So the child's got two problems. It's got firstly the emotion that the parent has, that, that it's powerless, mm-hmm. and that emotion that the parent has probably came from its parents and, mm-hmm. the, and the environment that it grew up in. And then in addition to that, the parent takes power over the child, which further exacerbates this particular problem inside of them emotionally. And so the child is feeling powerless. Mm. And a child who's feeling powerless will seek power elsewhere. Mm. So if if they're powerless with a parent, they will seek power elsewhere. Mm -hmm. If if, If they did not have respect of the parent, they will seek respect elsewhere. And if they did not have the feeling of worth from the parent, they will seek worth elsewhere. Mm -hmm. If the parent was jealous of them, they will seek positive emotions elsewhere. And and so all of these particular things, our seeking power, glory, position, uh, wealth, and so forth, all of these seeking emotions that people have, that they believe drives their desires, but they're not pure Mm -hmm. because they're driven by the underlying lack-based emotion, the opposite emotion that exists within the individual. And these emotions drive so much unloving behaviour on this planet because we are unwilling to feel the hurt of the deeper emotion, the grief associated with the deeper emotion. So we have a grief associated with powerlessness. We're afraid to feel that grief. So we have a layer of fear over the top of that grief. And then we enter the addiction of seeking power so that we don't have to feel the fear associated with the lack of power. Mm. For example, Mm. and and all of those emotions you mentioned, they all have the same relationship. So when we seek uh, power, glory, value, respect outside of ourselves, Mm -hmm. um, is that always a resistance to humility? Yes, always. We, We never do that in a pure state. No, there's no... A person who's truly humble never seeks any of these things. Those things might come to that person, mm-hmm. but, but the person doesn't seek them. 
right? If there's a difference between seeking them or desiring them than them coming through a natural process. For, for example, if you are passionate in a certain field of endeavour and you are so passionate that you finish up discovering new things that the world has never seen before, mm -hmm. then it's highly likely that you will finish up gaining the respect and the, uh, the, the, the honour and other emotions from other people because they honour your achievement, mm -hmm. but not because you were driven to get it. A person who's truly humble and in a state of true desire and love will actually not be doing it because they want to get that power or position, but rather they'll be doing it because it's their love. It's mm -hmm. what they love doing. And because they love doing it, it happened. Right? Now that is a state of humility. Mm -hmm. A state of a lack of humility is seeking prominence, power, glory, attention, approval and so forth by taking specific actions in order to get those particular things. We see this happening with a lot of people who want to be musical or singer, singer professional singers or you know, who want the glory and attention of, of that kind of a world. They are driven by very, very dark, unhealed emotions associated with a lack of respect, a lack of attention, a lack of approval. And instead of feeling those emotions, they are driven to get the attention that they desire. And, and some of them we know are, are willing to sacrifice anything for it. They'll sacrifice their own sexual integrity. Mm. They'll sacrifice their relationships. They'll sacrifice their personal self in terms of their um, looking after themselves, you know, even physically and emotionally. They'll, they'll, they'll take drugs if, they're, if the people they want the approval from are taking drugs. Mm -hmm. They'll do anything that, that their environment dictates if they want to be successful. And this is how much people are willing to sacrifice inside of themselves in order to seek these particular emotions, which indicates the, how high the level of grief associated with not having these particular feelings comes from their childhood. Mm -hmm that they're unwilling to feel, that they don't have any humility towards. Mm. So that's the relationship with humility. Mm. We would be avoiding, through taking these actions, we're avoiding quite a lot of emotion. Yes, every one of these actions is an addiction to help us avoid our fear associated with the grief, the deep grief, uh, that every one of these emotions are being driven by, every one of these desires are being driven by. Mm -hmm. And, and it's the, our desire to not feel powerless that causes us to seek the power. Mm -hmm. It's our desire to not feel the lack of glory or honour in our life that occurred in our childhood most probably that causes us now to seek glory and honour. Mm -hmm. uh, but a person who's humble doesn't seek those things. They just engage their desire for love they, and they love what they do and if glory comes along, it comes along. But if it doesn't come along, they're not disappointed. Because mm -hmm. uh, they're motivated by because they're motivated by their desire to do what their love is. So it occurs to me that we might see two people leading seemingly very similar lives in terms of the respect they have, or mm -hmm. uh, the power, or the um, the value they have in people's eyes, mm -hmm. and yet they could be driven by one could be in a very humble state, and another in a in a complete state of addiction and a lack of humility. Yes. If you see this a lot in the music, music industry where, where sometimes you meet very humble people who just love their music. They love just producing it. They love creating it. They just enjoy playing it. They'll, you know, even if they're not getting paid, they still play it, you know, and they just love doing it and that's the way it is, you know. Yeah. And they're often very humble people, they're not trying to prove anything, they're not trying to sell anything, they're not trying to make money out of it, and they're not trying to get attention or approval or glory from it. And they're just such a, you know, beautiful people to be around while they're playing their music. They're not into drugs and they're not into some kind of support of their of their profession in terms of you know getting spirit help through through some kind of addiction mm -hmm. and these are rare people but when you do see them you you can feel that they are in that place then you often meet others who who are maybe have the same amount of glory the same amount of attention the same amount of approval but they are driven totally by the lust for those particular things mm. And, uh, and and it's a terrible thing to be with those kind of persons generally. Well, you say that it's a terrible thing to be with those kind of persons, mm -hmm. but 
they are receiving a lot of attention from people. So why do we see this phenomena when someone who's very humble might gain success and someone who's completely um, has a lack of humility might also gain success? What is the phenomena that's occurring there? Well, the person who uh, lacks humility, who gains success, is gaining success through the unhealed addictions of the people who support their success. Mm -hmm. So, you know, many of the people who support the person who wants glory, for example, are looking for glory themselves and they want to honour a person in that regard. So they want glory themselves, they realise they can't do it. Mm -hmm. So what they do is they attach themselves to somebody who they personally feel associated with that will do it. Mm -hmm. And then they honour that person and give that person funds and they give that person their attention and time and honour them in order to avoid their own emotions about what they're doing. And um, and this is a very common thing, as you know. Yeah. In addition, the music, the person who's in, say, the music industry, who's in that second phase, will often have a lot of emotions, quite dark emotions, anger, rage, you know, grief, and all those kind of emotions, which they express through their music, and and these kind of emotions attract the same kind of people with the same kind of emotions to listen to their particular music. And, uh, and, and often they then, the people who are supporting the musician, feel, oh, they must know me because that's exactly how I feel. And they, you know, they, so they have all these emotional longings towards the individual which creates a desire, you know, which feeds the addiction for power or glory or attention or approval in the person. So that's very different to the humble person because the humble person is not worried about any of those things. Mm -hmm. The humble person is not creating his music so that everybody can listen to it. He's creating his music because he loves creating his music. Mm -hmm. And he's not doing it because of the desire, attention or approval he gets. He likes the fact that people want to listen to his music, but it, he doesn't view that as a sense of his own worth. In other words, he has worth even if nobody listens to his music. Mm -hmm. And the people who listen to his music generally are a lot uh, more wider audience generally. They, they have, uh, instead of having specific emotional addictions, they have a wide variety of emotional addictions, uh, you know, but, but they're not all honed in one or two or three places. So they're not necessarily having their emotional addiction satisfied through their association with this singer, for With example. the singer. They might have their emotional addiction satisfied through the music he creates, uh -huh. but not through the singer himself, mm -hmm. not through some kind of personal, uh, strange relationship with the individual that they don't even know, you yes. know, as they would in the second case with the person who lacks humility. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so then for this um, person who's not humble, who's seeking um, to avoid a lot of things through getting glory and attention, um, what effects can it have on the people that they are interacting with? You mentioned that there can be this addictive relationship form, but say with children or other people in their environment, what kind of things does it create? Well, generally, the people who are seeking these kind of emotions are very narcissistic. They, they have a very self-absorbed life and lead a very self-absorbed life. So if they have children, for example, the children will feel very neglected um, and, and not very honoured. And often the children will grow up with exactly the same emotion, of course, mm -hmm. that the parent now uh, has been seeking all of its life. And, and the sad thing about it is that these kind of people generally can't hold relationships well, they can't hold friendships well, you know, everything in their life aside from the glory or attention or approval they get is pretty much a mess. And, the, and, the, and this is why many people who have very public lives have, have very messy private lives because, because there are a whole heap of addiction supporting their public life that they don't get met in private. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so uh, oftentimes it, there's a lot of unhappiness in their life, which then causes them to, to um, seek even these things even more. And eventually uh, they finish up, oftentimes when they pass, by the time they've passed, they feel very alone because mm -hmm. the reality is very few people can support them, uh, emotionally support them. Mm. throughout their life mm. it's very hard for a narcissistic person to continue getting friends more f you know new friends new friends new friends and chewing up friends yeah. uh, like they're going out of fashion without sooner or later uh, ending up with very very few friends mm. as a result mm. 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 And or people who are just friends because of some addiction that is met yeah, mm. sure. Mm. You mentioned earlier about the example of the narcissistic singer mm -hmm. and um, you were saying those kinds of people are quite unpleasant to be around. Mm -hmm. 
and um, it occurred to me that that's because you don't want to enter an addictive relationship with them. So you feel it as a demand or an oppressive feeling to be around Whereas them. their fans would love to be around them. Yes. For exactly for, because of there would be a codependent addiction that gets met inside of the fans, you mm. know, by by having a, some kind of association with that person, and so their fans would actually feel very different to what I feel about being with the same person. And and that led me to think about a child of that that sort of a person. They obviously don't enter the world seeking an addictive relationship, so they must also feel quite similar. They will feel very similar. The child will find it very difficult to have a relationship with that person. Yeah, mm. very okay. difficult to have a fulfilling relationship. And I imagine feel quite oppressed. Feel oppressed, uh, also neglected, uh, unloved, unwanted, uncared for. Yes, mm. many, many different emotions. Yeah. Mm. yeah, And this is why many of the children of, you know, people who have been wealthy, powerful or, or popular uh, have a lot of deep grief to go through before they can become stable emotionally. Yeah. yeah. And is that also why we often see substance abuse in uh, yes. those kinds of situations? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Substance abuse is often a result of, uh, you know, it's another layer of adding physical addictions to the process mm. besides the emotional And, and avoiding the avoiding the oppression of the parent or the yes situation. trying to yeah. avoid the oppression of the parent so you want something to that helps you avoid the emotion of how unloved you feel mm-hmm. how unwanted you feel how how uh, pushed around and and uh, um, powerless you feel in the relationship mm. yeah okay mm. um, so it sounds like uh, in this set of resistances to humility that we only give of ourselves under very specific conditions if, if I was a person in that state. Is, is that true? Yes, a, per, a person who's seeking power, glory, attention, position, approval is only ever going to give in a situation where they'll get those particular things. So, so in other words, it's a, it's a bartering system, an emotional bartering system that they enter with every single individual. And if you're not prepared to enter the barter with them, that you, you'll never be their friend. Mm. That's the reality. They, they cannot love you, and they do not love anybody, actually. They only love the feeling of power, position, glory, attention, approval. Mm. That's what they love. So, so similar to how a person who's living in fear is made fear their God, then a person who's living in these things has made these things, glory, attention, approval, their God. Yes. And, and they'll do anything. To, to get that glory, attention, approval. It's impossible to have a, a, a relationship with integrity with, the, with such a person because they will always sacrifice the relationship for, for some kind of attention, approval or power. Mm. And so it's impossible to have a fulfilling long-term relationship with the individual unless you're totally willing to do exactly what their addiction demands. Yeah. Mm. So if I had this set of injuries, mm-hmm. what would I need to do in order to reach a state of humility? Well, have very difficult injuries to release again to get to a state of humility because you, because the addiction is usually firmly in place by the time the person's become an adult with these particular problems. Their world around them is tr- trying to uh, loosen up this problem uh, and help them to feel it. But unfortunately, the addiction is demanding, no, I want to only create a life that will give me these particular results. And so it requires a lot of sincerity on the part of a person who's living this kind of a life to actually break down through this layer of fear, through the addiction and into the layer of fear that they have about feeling the underlying grief, the Mm. fear about feeling the grief of of powerlessness, the fear about feeling the grief of, of, you know, being unwanted, the fear about feeling the grief that nobody notices me. Mm. Uh, you know these kind of powerful grief from our childhood of course there are also positions of untruth in a sense that um, the irony of life is that when we feel a sense of internal worth we won't seek the worth externally when we feel a sense of internal power we won't ex- seek the power externally mm-hmm. when we feel a sense of internal glory we, where we where we honor ourselves we won't seek honor and glory externally and so you know in the end there is this healed position that we have to reach an emotionally healed position where we have a feeling or a sense of internal power an intense sense of internal worth and these particular feelings only come when we release the the opposite when we release the the opposite feeling that created this 
driving desire for these particular emotions to be fulfilled. Mm. Mm. So it's really acknowledging a lot of truth from what you're saying. We need to at least open up to the fact that there's a different truth about what's... Um, yeah, and unfortunately, most people who are in such a condition don't open up to the truth until they've created a life that's been quite damaged. And then they come to recognise some of the truth about how they created this damaged life. And they then have some kind of self-reflection. You know, they have some kind of therapy or some kind of psychological help which helps them see the reason why they had such a desire for glory, for example, and the sacrifices that they were willing to make of their own self mm -hmm. and others to reach this pinnacle of glory. And, and, uh, and then once they start seeing that, they start seeing the emotion as a drug rather than just seeing the emotion as something that's good to have. Mm. So they start seeing the emotion as a problem that has caused the majority of their, of their underlying problems that have been caused through this addiction. And then they start working their way through it emotionally. And it's rare for a person to consciously see that, oh, I'm seeking power, and then to consciously work their way through their fear and in, uh, into their grief of how powerless they feel mm. without there being some kind of negative external effects in their life first. Yeah, because we've talked, we've given the example of someone seeking fame and glory in the wide, big wide world. Mm -hmm. But I, I also see that many, um, many people set themselves up in positions of power, glory, respect and value in terms of their own family. Mm -hmm. They're the mm -hmm. head of the household, they're the, the, the father, the mother, the wise old grandparent mm -hmm. who has really created many of these things in a way that perhaps gives them less feedback about it. Yes, and unfortunately, like we, we were in Brazil recently and, and both of us noticed there, didn't we, the, yeah. the, uh, the power of the mother, the yeah. matriarchal system there, which, where the mother believes that she, everyone in the family has to eventually basically just do what she says or do what she wants. And, and she's glorified. And as she's glorified as this beautiful woman as a result yeah. of that. And the reason why is that she has inculcated into her children this very, very strong desire to please her. And so now nobody in her immediate environment confronts the desire generally because they all know that if they confront the desire, mum's going to be an angry ogre who might finish up <laughs> excommunicating them from the family if they're not careful. And, and so they always get themselves back into line. Now, such a person has no consciousness or awareness of how much what, what they are seeking through those addictive relationships. And they, like I said, they need to come to some personal awareness that such behaviour is unloving and uncalled for, actually, in a family. Mm -hmm. And then they need to go through this process of opening or becoming more aware that these emotions are, are driving them and what, what, what the underlying reason for the emotions driving them are. Now, of course, for a person to do that, they've already got to be fairly humble yeah. <laughs> before they can actually go and do something like that. They have to have some degree of humility to, to look at themselves. And it's rare for such a person to do that. And, you know, when we were in Brazil, we talked to some spirits who, who, was, who passed into the spirit world and I asked them where their families were and they couldn't find them. And so what they did was they adopted another family on earth so they could do the same thing to it, not asking them themselves the question, why has my family deserted me? They've all passed. You know, yeah. Why have my family deserted me? Well, don't you think it's got something to do with how oppressive you are? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. And, and uh, once they, we started talking about that with that group of spirits um, and sort of taking them through the process of what was actually happening, there was initially a lot of resistance, just like there would be with people on the earth in the same condition. Mm. Yeah. And so really the family is a place where we might breed these kinds of addictions in ourselves or in our children. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking now mm -hmm. of the favoured child, the golden child or the long wanted child, or the child that suddenly uh, they're born and they're already given a lot of power, attention mm. um, and glory. And, and many of these golden childs grow up being very narcissistic, doing some very damaging things. Some even turn to rape and murder and other very damaging actions as a result of their, you know, being treated with this, you know, favouritism that that is developed within them. Yeah. So it's going to take a lot of humility for someone to really begin to look at themselves and look at what is the attention that others are giving me? Does mm -hmm. it give me a sense of feeling glorified or superior? And yeah. 
or I suppose what are the results in my family if I've had a family do I have children who uh, do substance abuse or are finding it difficult to to live in their life they would be maybe some of the indicators I would look for yeah would you say? but also um, I feel in these situations uh, you get this sort of um, situation where you feel a, per- a person who is truly humble feels a sense of when they're being honoured for something they have actually done or whether they're being honoured for in a worshipful way. Yes. And there is a very, very big difference between this worshipful honouring or glory or attention or power than, than being honoured for what you have actually achieved. Now, a person who's humble will accept being honoured for what they have actually achieved, but they would reject being honoured for things they have not achieved Mm -hmm. right and they actually would not agree with or enter into the codependent addiction emotionally for things that they have not achieved right and they'd recognize that also recognize the holes or the problems that they have in their own life or their own family or whatever it is as well so so when we're truly humble we may receive honor but it will be for what we've actually done Mm-hmm. Not for what everyone imagines we've done, right? Or, or not, and not for what everybody thinks we've done without any assistance. And we'll honour the assistance we've received as mm-hmm. well if we're truly humble. Mm-hmm. So there are ways to see whether the honour that we're receiving, or the glory, or attention, or approval we're receiving, is actually based around a real emotion or whether it's based around some kind of addiction. Mm-hmm. When we become truly sensitive and humble will actually feel the dishonourable addiction uh, as, an, as, a, as a very sleazy feeling mm-hmm. that we're being drawn from or taken from in the interaction and we will find it very difficult to engage. Mm. 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 Okay, mm. great. Let's move on to um, jealousy. Mm. Uh, we haven't been adding to the board either. So, uh, so we better uh, add, what was the other one? It was the um, seeking power. Yep. Seeking anything, really, isn't it? Emotionally, so power, glory. Yeah. Isn't it? And respect and value. Respect. Value, yeah. And the next one um, is jealousy. So the next one is jealousy. Resistance to humility through jealousy. Yeah. So can you describe jealousy for us? Well, again, jealousy is the result of us not being humble to certain emotions. Yeah. But, but jealousy is when we are in a rage or feeling angry or unhappy or hurt that uh, through some external event that we had generally no control over. Um, and it's usually related to a person, place, individual or, you know, or, or some kind of action. Mm-hmm. So what I mean by that is that, uh, for example, we can be jealous that somebody else has a big house. We can be jealous about our partner and what they're doing with their life. We can be jealous for our partner in the sense of feel like uh, our partner is mine. And you mm-hmm. know, any time she shows anybody else any level of respect or attention, then I'm jealous of her. We can be, uh, there is also other forms of jealousy related to when we feel our worth is being attacked Mm -hmm. so oftentimes you know this often happens in a partnership where if our partner shows some sexual attention to another person that we feel a large amount of jealousy because we feel our own sexual worth is now being attacked by her giving her worth to another Mm -hmm. or giving her attention to another Mm -hmm. and the reality is it is being attacked but but the reaction of jealousy is a denial of the underlying grief So uh, these emotions of jealousy can come up from many different situations and they involve uh, things that in- include fe- feelings that, that are related to jealousy, um, such as covet- coveting uh, a person. So in so other words, coveting? coveting is when um, we feel jealous that another person has a thing that we do not have and so then we want that thing and often we want that thing from that person as well there's a lot of rage in the in in the desire or, or the covetous desire if you like uh-huh. and covetous is an old word i suppose that yeah. you don't hear very often lately 
because it's sort of like it has biblical connotations. Mm-hmm. Um, but but the reality is that it is an emotion of jealousy where we we where where we want something from another that we don't usually have ourselves and we feel that we're missing. And when we covet it, we're willing actually to take actions to get it as well. So we re- take the extra step of not only just being jealous, but actually taking an action that actually gets the feeling satisfied, mm. uh, which often is very destructive. And people have murdered for that emotion. Mm. People have stolen for that emotion. People have raped for that emotion. There's all sorts of very heavy emotions involved in, in, in those particular aspects of jealousy. So would you say there's a group of key emotions that we would be avoiding when we become jealous? Yes, most of the emotions we avoid are about ourselves. So these are, and jealous-based emotions are always emotions, uh, the emotions that that we are avoiding are always related to ourselves and our own lack of worth. Mm -hmm. So it could be related to our own lack of sexual worth that we're unwilling to feel, our own lack of physical worth, financial worth. Mm Uh, it's also often related to security, but with regard to our personal worth with the security. Sure. We're not worth being safe. We're not worth being secure and yeah. so forth. And so because these emotions have deep feelings associated with worth, they're often very prevalent in society as a result. And things like, I'm thinking here now, like things like shame and feeling dirty, that's all related to our worth, isn't it? And very icky kind of emotions to actually connect to. Yes, and so jealousy is sort of the rage associated with our addiction not getting met. Mm. So our addiction, uh, so whatever the addiction is, and the addiction might, you give me a sense of sexual worth. If you don't give me a sense of sexual worth, then I attack you, mm-hmm. you know, and that's an act of jealousy towards you. So you might, if you shared your sex, sexual feelings with somebody else, then I no longer feel any sexual worth, so now I desire to attack you. Mm-hmm. And that in that rageful place, I'm now exhibiting my jealous emotions, which is a denial of humility. Mm-hmm. Because the reality is if, if I was humble, I would feel the hurt of how you don't feel I'm sexually worth staying with. And that is a very different emotion. That is a grieving-based emotion. Mm-hmm. And when we're afraid of feeling that level of grief-based emotion, we go to the jealous, rageful-based emotion. And I feel this is a really murky area, jealousy and the emotions we avoid um, that create jealousy. It seems to me that a lot of us even have issues just acknowledging that we're jealous. It's such an unpleasant emotion for ourselves even. And that's why I hesitated when I was going to ask you the question about what are the emotions lying underneath it? Mm -hmm. Because often I feel the real work we have to do is even acknowledge that That we we are. (laughs) That we feel that way. Yeah. 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 I agree. Um, The biggest problem with many of these emotions is acknowledging that we have them. It's the same with fear, same with anger, same with feeling, you know, wanting to feel powerful and, you know, all these what we believe are, you know, what they call them, the seven deadly sins or something, yes, yeah. um, you know, many of those emotions listed there are the emotions where everybody feels a bit sleazy inside of themselves when they feel they have them. Yeah. And it's this level of discomfort and judgment that we have about these particular emotions that causes us to not face what's underneath them. Mm-hmm. Unless I acknowledge that I'm jealous, I am never going to get to the emotion underneath it. Mm. Unless I acknowledge that I'm afraid, I will never get to the emotion underneath it. So part of humility is acknowledging that the emotion exists and is present and is alive within us and is dictating to us our life. You know, that, that, that is a, a very strong part of what we need to do if we're going to become humble to these emotions. It's like we need to admit to ourselves how dark we are before we can become lighter yeah. and and this is a process what I would call a process and it's the beginning of a process of repentance actually to admit to ourselves what things we actually have inside of us is a very important part of actually growing out of those things and having and, and becoming different you can't change something you cannot see or feel mm-hmm. And in particular, what you cannot feel, you cannot change. And so if you're, re- you're, if you're denying to yourself that you have a feeling of jealousy, this dark emotion of jealousy that maybe could even turn into rage, anger and murder in the end, um, then in, uh, if you're denying it, you're never going to actually change it. You're never going to release it. And you're never going to find what the underlying cause of it is. 
And as we talked about in the fear section, then we actually give it more power in our lives. Of course, and and unfortunately, the power is unconscious as well. So, so not only have we given that emotion, let's say it's the emotion of jealousy, more power by not acknowledging its existence, but also because we do not acknowledge our existence, it will dictate our life to us. It w- will become a jealous, it will live in the emotion of jealousy most of our life. Mm-hmm. And we will not realize how, what negative things it's creating even because we will be justifying to ourselves retaining the emotion of jealousy under certain circumstances. So the man who feels that it's right for him to go into a rage with his girl who has just sexually you know, interacted or flirted with another person, he is already justifying to himself rage and a, a very unloving act towards another for the sake of his denial of his own grief about what it meant for him sexually inside of himself, that he was now being treated as something that's of lesser value. Mm -hmm. And so he is automatically in large denial of the deeper grief that he doesn't want to choose to feel. Mm. Yeah. Okay, just finally about jealousy. Um, Is jealousy, are we always jealous of things that are that people actually have or can we perceive uh, that's a sad thing isn't it like a lot of the times we're jealous of what we imagine they have (laughs) a lot of times it's not even real you know like uh, you know we're talking to someone recently where they were jealous of another person because they were young (laughs) like (laughs) like, um, and had a you know pretty face or whatever you know these are even those things are not real in a sense Um, the, the person's not acting in a manner that would cause them to be jealous. They're just jealous of something. It's something. It's always jealousy is always driven by a feeling inside of ourselves, related to generally related to this big emotion of worth yeah. and a lack of worth. Mm-hmm. And it, it might be a lack of sexual worth, physical worth, phys- uh, emotional worth, uh, and uh, and even spiritual worth. It can be related to. Mm-hmm. So so je- often jealousy is a like a. It creates many imaginings inside of the human mind. Often it imagines things that are not even happening. <laughs> yeah. 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 But it's all created from what you're saying by avoiding these certain worthless these. Feelings. We prefer to imagine the ba- damaging situation that never occurred than we do to feel our grief about it potentially occurring. Isn't that like, amazing? Yes. We'd, we'd, we'd rather have the rage about it never having happened, mm-hmm. <laughs> but believing that it has, mm-hmm. than we would feel the grief that it might happen or has happened in the past. Yeah. yeah. And that's a sad thing about such emotions. Definitely. Yeah. Such emotions always uh, show a lack of humility, demonstrate a lack of humility, because because they are layers above the the, the addiction associated with the fear associated with the actual emotion that we need to feel Mm -hmm. so so it's three or four layers removed from feeling the actual emotion Mm. and most of us it seems operate in that top layer Mm -hmm. most of our Mm -hmm. life unless we really do this work yes and hence psychologists have come up with this concept that we live in our subconscious because our these things, which could be conscious, mm. are, are actually subconscious in most people. Most people are not consciously aware they have the underlying grief-based emotions which trigger these kind of, you know, addictions. And and so, you know, instead of instead of feeling the grief-based emotions, which are the creator of all of these things, they they go into living their life in addiction, not even really knowing why or understanding why. The reality is, we're all capable of understanding why we're all pre- pretty intelligent as humans and certainly much more intelligent than the average monkey and uh, and so we have a capacity to understand why it's all happening but we have high levels of denying yeah yeah why why it's happening why it's happening mm-hmm. okay so let's move on to commiseration mm-hmm. what is commiseration and how does it prevent humility well, commiseration is that the underlying desire that another person supports my belief or emotional state. And it could be support anything, actually. Support something that gives me some kind of validation. And, and commiseration uh, usually means, in the end, that we start to grumble for attention, 
we want approval, we complain how bad everything is so that everyone will tell us that it can be better and, and so forth. We want others to agree with our own assessment of things just because it makes us feel like our assessment had some value and we want others to make us feel good about ourselves by agreeing with us all the time. Yeah. Um, even when they feel it's impossible to agree with us, we still want them, want them to, to agree with us. And even when we're wrong, we still want them to agree with us. Mm. And we want them to commiserate with our state, our life, what we've created. And the main reason why we wish to do all of this is we don't want to take personal responsibility for anything that we've created. And we want some kind of uh, global acceptance of our own creation. And everybody we accept into our life should agree that what else would we have created given the circumstances <laughs> yeah well and that was my next question I suppose is why would we become addicted to commiseration and you've probably just answered that yeah it's a it's because we do not we're refusing to take responsibility for our own creations we're refusing to be humble to our own emotions of what we have created we are refusing to uh, see that our own assessment of things are actually flawed or mm -hmm. have errors based in them we're refusing to see our own denial. We, we want everybody else around us to support our condition of denial. And in re reality, what we're really doing is we're wanting everyone around us to support our own lack of growth, our own stagnation, our own life. Yeah. We, we, we basically are saying, here's my life. You all need to agree that it's good, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Even when it's bad, you, we need to agree it's good. Even when it's untruthful, we need to all agree it's good. And that way the person feels, oh, I'm good now and I can, I can avoid a lot of emotions in that place. Can it work in the opposite way? Can I want everyone around me to agree that it's bad? Totally, yeah. yeah. You know, the hand re hand, you know, the the Australian poem, we'll all be ruined, said hand re hand, you know, yeah. every time, you know, and, and as, he, as it progressed, you know, it, it was no rain coming, we'll all be ruined, we'll all be ruined. And then when the rain comes, we'll, all we'll still ruined. all be ruined, you yeah. know, like, you know, because he basically just had a pessimistic attitude about it the whole of life yeah. and he wanted everybody to agree with him and many people are like that they, yeah. they get some emotional support mm -hmm. from this level of personal agreement that others mm -hmm. have with them and uh, it's it's actually very uh, like unpleasant emotion to be around in a lot of ways because you get pulled into the web of the person the person is only going to give you any you know love or attention or approval if you agree with them mm. And, and if you support their life. Now, obviously, if, if the earth is in so much error, that means the people are in a lot of error, right? If the people are in a lot of error, then somebody's going to have to disagree with the <laughs> error before people are going to change. And, and if we're addicted to commiseration, that means we're going to be addicted to everybody staying the same. We're going to be addicted to everybody having the same opinions. Things are not going to change if everybody has the same opinions. And actually, the world itself, if we look at it honestly, has a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. And if all of us have the same opinions about it, <laughs> and all of us commiserate with each other about it, none of us are going to get out of the problem yeah. uh, and, uh, and experience a different life here on Earth. Commiseration is, a, is a, I believe, a very weak emotion, and it causes so much damage to this planet it causes so much damage to individual relationships as well because nobody ever challenges the status quo. Mm. Nobody ever, you know, and, and look at what happens to the person who does challenge it. Because mm -hmm. the people are addicted to this commiseration emotion, mm -hmm. every, if every time you don't agree with something, you get attacked mm. just because no, everybody wants you to commiserate with it. Everybody wants you to agree with their opinion. Yeah. And, and, and it's very difficult to agree with opinions that are wrong, but they still want you to. Yeah. <laughs> and particularly from God's perspective, imagine it from God's perspective. God knows the absolute truth of everything. And God's looking at the earth going, yeah, pretty much everything you're doing is wrong. Right? <laughs> now, at some point, if God commiserated with it all and said, yeah, you're doing everything wrong, but that's okay. You know, like, it's not okay. Like the reality is it's not okay. Mm. While God allows it to occur because we have the gift of free will, God's not up there going, oh, yeah, no, I agree with that choice. I agree with that choice. You know, obviously there is a truth mm. that we can change. Mm. And the problem with commiseration is it causes us to be completely blind to the truth. We desire blindness to the truth even. <laughs> And obviously in our life, we're fairly committed to speaking truth with people. Mm -hmm. um, and what I observe is that uh, firstly, 
many of us start out in this state of wanting to be blind to the truth that we can change and wanting commiseration for that. And then um, perhaps you point out there is a truth that they can change. And then there's a desire for commiseration that it's too hard to change or exactly. we and didn't know we were wrong. Yeah. Or, now they want me to say, oh, it's good that you didn't know that you were wrong and it's good that you, you know, that you're now, it's too hard to change and it's good that, you know, they, they want me to say, no, it's not good. Now, how can you say those things? It's yeah. not, none of those things can be commiserated with. And, oh, you know, there's a very strong one that, that seems to be prevalent. Oh, but I had a bad childhood. Surely you can realise that this choice that I've just made that's unloving came from my bad childhood. Well, no, it didn't come from your bad childhood. I've seen many people who have had a terrible childhood who still make loving choices. Mm. So, so it didn't come from your childhood. It came from your willingness to justify mm. not dealing with the emotion from your childhood. That's where it came from. Mm. And, and so it's very difficult to commiserate with people under those circumstances. And in fact, impossible if you love them. It's impossible to commiserate if you love somebody. So then could you contrast for us commiseration and compassion? Well, compassion understands the truth associated with the condition. Commiseration is not interested in the truth associated with the condition. It wants to deny the truth associated with the condition. So they are completely different emotions. Compassion is when I, can, when I, have, when I have true compassion for what a person is going through. I understand the truth completely about why they're going through what they're going through. If I am commiserating with them, I don't understand the truth completely and I support their error. Mm. And that is something that's very unloving action to take. Yeah. And so how would I behave? Uh, how would there be a difference in my behaviour between the two states or my feelings? Or When we have compassion, it's a feeling of love for the person. Mm -hmm. The feeling of love is a, a feeling based on complete understanding of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Commiseration is not interested in understanding. It's interested only in giving them a feeling of approval. Mm -hmm. right? It's, a bar it's, a, it's a, an addictive bartering system mm -hmm. to give the person a sense that they're right. Mm -hmm. Compassion in a situation where somebody is wrong would still be compassionate, but they would tell them that they're wrong. <laughs> yeah. Commiseration in a situation where somebody is wrong would, would have a facade of compassion and tell them that they're right. Even if it's just Even an emotionally, it, it, that's the, correct. The yeah. feeling coming from them is. Oh, you're right to have that. Yeah, yeah. it's okay for you to be yeah. so angry. It's okay for you to be so upset. Yeah. It's okay for you to be so afraid. Mm. It's not okay. These are all error-based emotions that need to leave. We need to feel them, but it's not okay that they're there. We need to understand why they're there. And whereas if we're compassionate, we we are accepting that they're there. We accept they're there. We have compassion for how it got there, but we do not agree with them being there. Mm. Yeah. We do not support the person retaining them, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which is a very different state than commiseration. Sure. Yeah. And in fact, we we confront the person who wants to retain them, mm. and we can still be compassion, compassionate doing that. Yeah. Mm. So a truly humble person wants to feel everything that they feel. A truly humble person wants to know the truth about every situation. A truly humble person is willing to feel the truth about every situation, not avoid it. A person who wants commiseration, they don't want to do any of those things. So they're definitely not humble. And they can act humble. Oh, my life's so terrible and I feel downtrodden and meek and mild, but the reality is they're not humble at all. So when we're truly humble, how would we respond to others wanting to commiserate with us or our problems we would never commiserate with an individual when we're truly humble because we understand the danger of doing so causes them to retain the emotion that's suppressing their their true healing so so we would never commiserate with them we would have compassion for them but we would disagree with them mm. we would have a feeling of compassion for them but we would still disagree with their untruth and what about if someone attempts to commiserate with me? We would also, if we were truly humble, feel that as to be a very sleazy emotion mm. and we would not engage it. We would actually ask the person to go away probably rather than to project such emotions at us. And, and also we would question them as to why they're commiserating when I'm trying to feel something 
that actually is to do with a healing based emotion mm. why are they trying to commiserate with me because it's an attempt to shut me down mm. and actually when we commiserate with other people we are shutting down the expression of their causal emotion mm. yeah mm. so it's actually damaging on the giving and receiving end yes yeah, yeah. as are many of these emotions yes yes yeah, yeah mm. as we've seen mm. Okay, well, the final, the final point I wanted to speak to you about today is something that I've just labelled as false humility. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I suppose that uh, you've been teaching for a while now, for some time, and there are some large amounts of people listening. Mm-hmm. Um, and many of them, you, you emphasise the importance of humility, mm-hmm. the, the, which is essentially about having a willingness and a desire to feel ourselves and our own emotions. Mm-hmm. And um, something I observe happening is that people get into um, a tear tally. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, they feel that it's which all about... Which is an about... indication of a lack of humility. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, this the is fact that they're tallying it, for example, <laughs> and perhaps that's a, that's my joking way of yeah. saying it, but a feeling that we must cry, we must cry all the time at any moment, and um, and that any expression of emotion is an expression of humility. Could Which you? Which is very false, isn't it? Yes, I believe that this is a false expression of humility. Mm. Um, it's a facade of humility without the substance. Yes. Yeah. 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 So. Um, and often invi- in, invites spirit influence as well. So you often see people who, you know, because they really, like, for example, a person who's seeking glory and attention on the divine love path wants to have everybody else on the path, uh, you know, and I don't know why they call it the path, the divine love path. It's probably the way, you know, that God encourages us to connect to God. It's all about our relationship with God in reality. But a person who's seeking attention in that process will go, oh, yes, I cried five times today and four times yesterday and and then I cried about this and I cried about that. And and it's just another way of seeking attention and approval. It's got nothing to do with reality. And oftentimes they open themselves up to spirits as well. And so they often feel the emotion of the spirit just so that they can say they had an emotion. Mm. And it's very damaging to them. Very damaging. So what are the emotions that are driving this kind of behaviour? Well, all false sense of humility comes from some of these other emotions we've already mentioned. It mm-hmm. comes from a rage about having to feel your own emotions. It comes from a desire to have commiseration. It comes from a desire for glory, attention or approval, just in a different way. You know, so in the end, it's still the suppression of the same. Any time we have a facade of humility we are actually still seeking the same... We still have exactly the same levels of resistance that we've already discussed. And what is We're it? just being less honest about it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and to me, that's even more concerning. That's actually creating a facade upon a facade at times. Of course. Yeah, so um, it's sort of like a layer of facade upon another layer of facade. It's just another layer we're going to have to deconstruct at some point and look at why we are deciding that fake is actually preferable to real. Yes. And the reality is for many people, fake is preferable to real. Mm. You know, the key to see whether we're actually progressing towards God is to look at our life over the last two or three years. If we've done a lot of crying and there's little change in our life, then all of that crying was a facade. Mm. All of it. Mm. It was all a lack of humility, a whole lot of it. So humility is not crying. People believe, if people believe humility is crying, they are very, very mistaken. Humility is feeling all of the emotions that are present. For many people, the emotions that are initially present are addictions and they need to feel those. Mm-hmm. And for them, underneath that, there's, or, or above that, often there's anger. Above that, there's often denial. And they need to be, all of those need to be felt. And you're not going to be crying when you're feeling those. You're going to be feeling angry and upset and rageful and uncomfortable and all these other types of feelings. And, and then they've got to get into their fear. And, and fear is another level of emotion. And you need to feel your fears. But you can't justify it to yourself or commiserate with everyone about, oh, I felt this fear the other day. Isn't this wonderful how I felt that fear the other day? My question is, well, has your life changed in that direction? If it hasn't changed, then you didn't feel anything. And, and this is what I find quite strange with people. And, and it's just another way of creating another way of life, similar to a religion in a way. Many people, what many people are doing with the divine love path of what we've been trying to teach is they try, they're going to themselves, yeah, I'm on the divine love path. 
So, so in other words, it's sort of like saying, I'm a, I'm a Catholic now. It's exactly the same thing. And I go to church every weekend. I, I go to the meetings all the time. Uh, so there's the comparison. And, and I pray every day. Uh, I talk to God every day. I cry every day. Yeah, or, and then I, and I um, treat everybody nicely. I, I, you know, and, and there's all these comparisons, but in your end, there's, there's all facade, the whole lot facade for many of them. They have not made a substantial change in their entire life for the last period of time that they've been following the religion. Let's say it's, let's say it's a religion, any religion. If a person hasn't made substantial changes in the way in which they live their life in the last five years with any religion, then the religion is not benefiting them. It's not bringing them into more harmony with love, more harmony with truth, more growth, more humility, more anything. Now, the same applies to any person who's listened to the divine truth. If it hasn't substantially changed their life in the last two, three, four, five years that they've been associated with it, then they haven't done anything. They haven't made any sincere changes. Their soul's not growing. So nothing's changed. So what's the difference of being in that way of life than it is in being uh, like any other religious or, or any other uh, um, thing that we could actually pursue? Yeah. None. None whatsoever. We need to understand that when we get into this truthfully, we're going to be going through some very real experiences. Mm -hmm. and, and to be honest, to talk about them demeans them. The majority of people do not realise the reason why I do not share my emotions with people except in a teaching environment is because to talk about my emotions, I find even in a teaching environment, demeans the experience. Mm -hmm. The actual experience was often far more powerful than what I can describe and far more life-changing than what I can describe and had a far bigger effect on the rest of my life than what I can describe. Mm -hmm. And all I'm attempting to do is describe it so that people can understand that that's what it's going to look like. There's going to be change. It's trying to contain a sunset into a, two sentences. That yes. That's sort of uh, the description of a sunset. You know, it's like last night in our interview when you were asked, you know, what, what, what's been your life since you met me sort of thing and, and give you an answer in, you know, one minute. And, <laughs> and it's like impossible, yeah. really. It's an impossibility because, because the reality is that these are very huge experiences emotionally that cause your whole life to change. And, and, and if you are truly progressing on any path, scientific, religious or otherwise, you will have changed mm -hmm. in the last few years. And if you have not changed, then you are not sincerely doing it. Mm -hmm. Or the path itself is not actually working. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work. So, so there's one of those two things. Now, I know from my personal experience that the path works, right? And that's why I'm teaching it. But I have not seen many people make sincere changes on the path. There's not a large amount of people on the planet making sincere changes. And the reason why is because they're not being sincere about their true feelings. And in other words, they are not being humble. Mm. That's the problem. Yeah. Yeah, I, I haven't written commiseration on the board either. Should we? Yeah, sure. And, and false humility is sort of what we're discussing. Uh, one, e is? No, uh, one is. One yeah. yep. And false humility. Yeah. I suppose that I feel that uh, in the times when I'm experiencing humility, it's very life feels edgy. Like it, <laughs> you know, I'm on the edge of my comfort zone all of the time. All the time. And that's what humility really feels like. But it's also good. You get used to that after a while, almost. And, and it's like, uh -oh, like everything's always edgy after that. And it's well, and the, the feedback is so profound. And instant. It, and instant. You mm. know, you operate on the edge of your comfort zone. You face something and you know you're different forever. And you and know, if, and your world changes. Yeah. Everything changes around you, you know, instant, instantly too. Yeah. Like within a day, everything's changed. And yeah. Yeah. And there's freedom and more joy, but then you've still got to be, if you're really humble and sincere, you'll be on the edge again. Yeah, of, with of another issue. At something else. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So and the reality is true. If you're truly humble and you become at one with God, you're still going to be in the same place, edgy. on the edge all the time, discovering new things. You're in your passion now. There's not all these really harsh negative emotions associated with the discovery of new things, but you're still like feeling this passion of life. Like, you, you know, you can't avoid it. If you're truly humble, you will not 
be in a state where you you go, oh, life's a bit ho hum today, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and it does feel like to me the contrast between living and being in a coma. Yes. And um, and the difference is this humility factor. Yeah. Um, if I'm humble, I'm alive. Yeah. If I if I'm living in these other resistances we've talked about, yeah. it feels sort of. I think the reason why there's so many zombie movies today is because most people are in a coma when, they <laughs> and when the they zombie pass. the zombie feeling sort of appeals, you know, like. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, yeah. It's exciting when they run around with a knife. <laughs> <laughs> That's how everyone. <laughs> but it's a it's a sad. Uh, like it's a sad statement of huma- humanity's condition, really, in that in that the average person who's in passionate desire with their life is often like criticized, looked down upon, you know, condescended to. You know, if we've got a childlike passion in any area or endeavor, we're, it's often beaten out of us in, in this world that we live in. And, and that's because generally in the world, there is this terrible lack of humility. The reason why we've got so many problems in the world is because we lack the humility to see that we created them. That's the main reason why. And as I said at the beginning of this series of, of interviews with you, humility causes our own death. Mm. The reality is if we were all completely humble, none of us would ever die even mm. because we, we'd feel all emotion. Any negative experience we had would all be gone from us. It would not create any physical problem within us. We'd be humble in our relationship with other people so we'd never attack them, we'd never harm them. We'd be humble in terms of what we notice, in terms of what's happening around us. We'd understand science. We'd understand the world around us. We'd understand the earth systems and how they all work. We'd understand when it's going to be a bit damaging and it's good to get out of its way. We'd understand all of those things automatically because we're humble. And and so there's no real chance of us even dying under those circumstances. So a lack of humility causes our own death in reality. Mm. It's, and, and if people understood that's how strong the, the lack of humility is the power that the lack of humility has it, to create our own death mm. the, the power of humility is that it can create your own eternal life <laughs> yeah. like that's, even here on earth it can create your own eternal life mm. along with all of your happiness and everything else humility can create but mankind has just such a terrible viewpoint of it that uh, and ridicules it and can't accept it, can't accept that state of fully feeling and experiencing everything within ourselves and remaining humble to the entire experience and having an, a feeling inside of yourself that that of a of an accurate position of your own condition in relation to everything. So I know that I am equal to you, not higher than you, not lower than you, equal to you, and humility creates. That. Humility accepts truth. Mm. It accepts it without resistance. Mm. It's it's just a beautiful quality. Yeah. Mm. Mm. And and with regards to false humility, this this phenomenon we're talking about now, mm-hmm. it feels to me like there's such an inertia on the planet surrounding the resistance to truth, the resistance to humility, that even when you come forth and present a teaching that is based in humility. Mm-hmm. Um, people, it takes such a such an effort to overcome this inertia mm-hmm. that they end up actually sliding back into it and and creating a false humility rather than yeah, actually, an arrogance really. Like yes. how many people who believe they're on the path go around saying, "I'm on the divine love path," like, and I know the truth, and I know and, the yeah. truth now. Yeah. When in their heart, they yet to know hardly anything really. They yeah. you know, yet to have a real physical change and and heartfelt change. Yeah. And it's because of their own arrogance, really. It's not humility for a person to do that. It's arrogance mm. to, to, to go, out and, oh, I know the truth now. Oh, you know, I heard the truth from Jesus and I know it. It's, what's the difference between that and a person who's a Christian saying, oh, you know, the Bible's the truth, or a Muslim saying, oh, the Koran's the truth and I know it now. And there's no difference. And the reason why we have so much conflict between each one of these religions is because they're all, well, one of the reasons is because they're all going, oh, I know the truth now, aren't I good? Mm. And no, you're not good. You've just come to your senses. 
for the first time often. <laughs> but if we're still living in a state of arrogance, we, we haven't, haven't even begun. We haven't even begun, have we? No. Yeah. No, not yeah. at all. We, and we have no idea or clear conception of our true position in life mm. and our true position in the universe mm. when we have a lack of humility. You know, our own condition in relationship to God and relationship to the power of the universe that God's created, we have no concept of mm. if we lack humility. We can't learn anything if we lack humility, actually. We can intellectually absorb, but we can't actually emotionally learn. Mm. Mm. Which probably brings me towards the end of the interview. Mm -hmm. um, and that, really, you are the most humble person I know. Mm, thanks, babe. <laughs> I've ever known. Mm. And I observe you in our life, you know, you cop a lot of um, criticism, anger, people justifying their rage at you and their ridicule towards you and um, their cynicism gets projected at you. Um, all of their insecurities and fears uh, become projected at you. I observe this happening a lot and I observe you being very humble to it. You don't place resistance. You don't get angry back. You, you very much um, grieve if, if that's what those experiences bring up for you. But mm. I also see that you've you've been so humble that even now you can receive these things and a lot of those emotions have left you and you're able to just be in a state of love mm. with with everyone around us um and firstly that is a beautiful example um and one i feel very honored to share with you in your life mm, thanks mm. um and i see you as someone who has overcome that inertia which seems so great uh, mm. on the planet. But I do know that you have overcome it. You weren't born <laughs> in mm. this state mm -hmm. and you have developed humility. And to me, this is yeah. one of the most inspiring things about our discussion is not that you are just telling me a bunch of facts, that you're telling me things from your lived experience. Um, and I know if I was to interview you about that in detail, that would perhaps be a whole other interview. Mm. But would you mind sharing with us something of that journey or some of the things that you've had to deal with in order to be humble? Well, the reality is I've probably had to deal with almost everything we've listed <laughs> over the last, you know, five sessions, really. Um, you know, I've had every one of those emotions at some point. Uh, I've had to go through the experience of finding out why and even desired to find out why even though everyone around me doesn't want me to. And I've also had to choose to do it alone in a lot of times without support because most of the support is in the opposite direction mm -hmm. on the planet. Mm -hmm. And I've had to do it with lots of criticism under lots of pressure and, and usually under fire, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, because of that though, I've learnt the importance of my relationship with God and my relationship to God giving me the truth that will get me through everything. And so I have not, as a result of that, I gave up relying on everyone around me. I gave up relying on somebody supporting me or helping me through the process. And, and I just focused entirely on my relationship with God about that. And, and I, feel, I feel that's what most people are neglecting in this, in this drive for truth, is that is they still want somebody holding their hand, not realising they've got the master of the universe, God, holding their hand, if they accept their, the hand of God. They'll have God holding their hand. And, and I feel too that God loves to hold the hand of a humble person. Um, you know, there's this quality in God I believe that is also uh, where that God has can, and can see a person truly who is humble because the person starting to see themselves as God sees them and because of that connection and linkage um, there's a deep connection between God and yourself when you're truly humble you don't have to be at one with God yet to have a connection with God when you're truly humble when you're truly humble, you feel God more. And, of course, God can feel you more now. God always feels us, but, but there's all this addiction and other crap that, we've, you know, that we project to God generally. 
and we don't feel ourselves very well but once we are humble we're starting to feel ourselves we're feeling ourselves as god feels us and, and so to me that that i feel is what most people neglect here and most people who are seeking fo a false humility are actually neglecting entirely their true relationship with god and and wanting still addictions met through their environment so I've had to give all that up. Like uh, that's part of the issue of teaching something that's new and different is that is that you're never going to get acceptance right at the beginning, and in fact it can be many centuries or even millennia later that acceptance comes, and you have to be humble to everything that happens in between, uh, as well if you really want to maintain that relationship with God and keep in connection with God. So. So I've had to learn to, um, to give up all of these things, all of these resistances, and I've had to give up even somebody supporting me in the process. I've had to give that up. And, and I still don't feel that I've completely given some of that up in the sense of emotionally, I still can feel there's a few more emotions for me to work through with some stuff like that. Um, but um, in the end, when you the first, you often get criticised, judged, condemned, uh, in every possible way. Um, and if your desire for God is strong enough, and your desire to be humble with God is strong enough, you'll go through all of those things, mm -hmm. and still stay humble. And also, I feel most people don't recognise that humility is a choice. It's a it's an emotional choice, but it's a choice. It, we, we, we can be in any situation and choose humility over any other position, including arrogance. We can, we can choose to actually feel what's really going on rather than avoid what's really going on. We can choose to see our life as it truly is. You know, so I, I see the faults in my body as, as they truly are right now. I know what they are. You know, I find it interesting when somebody else comes and tells me about it. I say, well, are there any others? And they don't know of any others, and I can list them all. <laughs> like, so I'm actually more humble to my own condition than other people are able to, who, who, who can come to tell me things. And that's a part of it too, is to, to actually see yourself truthfully and, and to not need other people to see you truthfully. Mm. Yeah. I observe that in you also, is that you're very conscious of yourself and and if there is an issue or something's not working or something's not resolved, you're always asking for more truth about it. Always. Uh, I see people have a per somehow a perception of you that you are not seeking more truth, and I observe you daily seeking more truth mm. and and recognizing God, the sovereignty of God. I suppose mm -hmm. that that um, God has the knowledge and that you are the person. Um, seeking it <laughs> yes. uh, and yeah. receiving it because of this humble state you have surrounding it yeah yeah and and if we could remind everyone that humility is not a uh, it's not an intellectual decision mm. it's a state emotional state it's a state of being able to absorb new truth and give up what you believe is true mm. so so you know people often ask me you know this divine truth of yours and I go I'm sorry it's not mine like it's what I've it, I, I, all I see myself as is I'm like a scientist discovering truth about a specific subject so so let's say I'm a scientist discovering truth about the atom I'd have to be open to any possibility right? and I feel I feel with regard to to God and the universe and all those things that I'm passionate about discovering new truth about I am open to any new possibility. If somebody can prove that what I'm saying is wrong, I'm perfectly able to accept that it's wrong, mm -hmm. right? if it's able to be proven, perfectly able. I have no emotional investment in being right at all, and, and, although many people think I do. Mm -hmm. I do not have any emotional investment in being right. I do have a deep emotional investment in desiring truth from God. Mm -hmm. Like I have a very, very strong desire to know what the truth is from God. And it's not my truth. It's mm. never going to be my truth, in the sense, because universal truth exists whether whether I it existed before I existed. It will exist if I ever pass away. It will exist. I don't think I'll pass away ever now because of being in the condition of receiving God's love. 
and if I passed away, then God would have to pass away too. Mm. But um, but I do know for certain that that as long as I exist, this there'll be more universal truth to discover, and 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 the way I see it right now is that is that I know very little of it. I know a lot more in comparison to many people on the planet, and that is a statement of truth. Mm. But but it also is a statement of humility in the sense that it's not mine mm. it's not mine i've only learnt it and the only reason why i've learnt it is because of this quality mm-hmm. it's not not because of having any greater intellectual power than somebody else or having any greater imagination or receiving more help from spirits because i have not received help from spirits discovering any of this truth it's all about the fact that i've been humble enough to accept when i'm wrong and and to accept something new from god and and that's really what humility does for you. It it allows truth to be absorbed. Yes, and that that's how I wanted to round out the interview. I suppose is is um, asking you about how humility relates to truth. And I think you've just mentioned that. Um, and also, I see that you have a commitment to speaking truth to others, but it's you don't view it as your own truth. It no, and it's also speaking truth to others is a state of humility. I know many times that if I speak the truth, they will not believe me. They'll be condescending towards me. They'll disagree with me. They'll attack me. They might even harm me physically. They'll attempt to harm me emotionally almost in every case. Mm. Um, and yet, if I'm humble, I will accept all of that as emotional projections that I just need to feel if I have any more feelings associated with them. But I still need to tell the truth because... Once I'm in a state of humility, I recognise the importance of God's truth. Mm. It's more important than I am. It's far more important than my life. It's more important than my welfare. It's more important than my security. It, it's not more important than my happiness because it will always create my happiness. Mm. And it's not more important than love because it will always create more love in my life. But it's more important than many other things that most other people place importance on. And and, uh, what, and, uh, and the fact that I honour that is a state of humility, that I honour the importance of God's truth, mm. divine truth. Yeah. And just finally, what's, what's the relationship between love and humility then? Well, as I've said in many discussions already, and I think it's a great place to finish off this interview with, humility is the only doorway to truth. Without humility, you will never be able to discover new truth, ever, whatever, in, in any field of endeavour. And, and tr- it's the truth that creates freedom. So, so once we know the truth, fear disappears. All these other things start to disappear. But the truth also creates something even more powerful than that, and there's, that is the ability to connect to God and receive love. So, so truth is the doorway to divine love that being the case you could say truth is God's love is God's but humility is mine so humility is the only quality that I can personally develop that that helps me develop my relationship with God and my relationship with the universe if if I develop humility then truth will come to me and I'll be able to absorb it and if I develop humility and absorb this truth, love will come to me and I'll be able to absorb it. But the love is not mine, it's from God. And the truth is not mine, it's from God. But the humility is mine. It is the quality that exists within me that enables these particular things to occur. And in that regard, you can be, you can, you can be happy that there is one thing that your relationship with God is dependent upon yourself with, and that is your, your humble exercise of your own will. Mm-hmm. So the development of this quality of humility is, is, has, will have the largest effect on your life that you can imagine, uh, more than any other quality, more than any other thing that can be developed inside of yourself by yourself. Because mm-hmm. I, I personally don't believe that love can be really developed by yourself. If you're truly ever going to become loving, you're going to need to receive God's love. Mm. If you're truly ever going to know the truth, you're going to have to receive God's truth. So these things are God's, not mine. Mm. But humility is something I can develop. 
It is, it is the thing upon which everything else is dependent upon, inside of me. And that's why it's so important. Would you call it the way that we offer ourselves to God or the way we submit to God's process is just humility? Yes, well, well I feel humility is the way. Mm. The actual way to God is this process of becoming completely humble. Mm. That is the way. And once you become humble, you start feeling and accepting the truth. And you, you will acknowledge the truth that God exists. You'll acknowledge the truth that God has love to give. You'll then desire that love even once you've humble. All of those truths can come to you. It, so humility is the primary foundation of the way to God. Mm -hmm. Without it develop, being developed as quality, it is impossible to get to know God. And it's impossible to become at one with God without it. It is, the, it is the cause of our being born again, humility. And so, yeah, I just feel that for, if everybody understood that better, then humility would be a far more important topic of conversation on the planet than what it currently is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, my love. Thanks, darling. Thanks for the interview. And thank you for our yeah, assistants who have helped us to record the interview as well. Do you want to just show there's a <laughs> leaner on one camera there? Lad on another, and the sound is over there, <laughs> your, and our little audience that we've had checking on us to make sure we're all doing the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. Just such a privilege to yeah, receive it so directly, yeah. like in the interview process. Yeah. 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 yeah.